fail. That did not work at all, man. <laughs> Let us start the show properly now. We've dealt with more uh, yes. podcast technical problems, which is always the worst way to start a podcast, but seems to be becoming a, uh, yes. a trend. Yes, it's always super exciting for people listening to us to hear about our technical problems. Last time we mentioned Patreon as a way for people to support us. We recorded quite possibly the worst advertisement ever recorded in podcast history. Yes, that is, that is entirely possible. We did a... a, a on the spot recording of an advertisement, which sounded like a good idea in theory, but yeah. maybe in practice turned out terribly. But in spite of our, our atrocious advertisement, we have many people to thank for supporting us on the Patreon. So just wanted to say thank you to all of those people who have decided to chip in to help the show. And at this point, our first list of Patreon supporters should be at hellointernet.com slash Patreon if you went for the higher tier. And your name will be listed there as one of our official patrons. So thank you very much. Like a Hall of Fame sort of, uh, you know. It is like a, the most amazing Hall of Fame that there ever has been, I think is the best way to describe that. Have you done it like, does it look like an honor board? Like has it got like a wood background and it looks like the names are like etched in gold? And what, Well, we are recording this ahead of time. So right now I have actually done nothing at all. <laughs> we're just, right, we're, we're, this is where we have to pretend, Brady, right? Because people oh, okay. will be listening to this in the future. Oh, <laughs> right? oh, I'm looking at the page now, Gray, and it looks fantastic. <laughs> yes, that, that, that was that was super convincing, Brady. <laughs> so, yes, that, that will be up. And again, just wanted to thank the, the people who were supporting us. But people will be listening to us on Christmas morning, possibly, if they are incredibly dedicated fans, because this is our Christmas show. Can you put podcasts up on Christmas morning? Like, do the Apple Elves work on Christmas Day to like, approve podcasts and things like that. Well, I guess this is another one of these things that we are going to find out. It could be our Boxing Day edition. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Fingers crossed this is our Christmas show. Perhaps it isn't. Who knows? Anyone who listened to the last podcast, in fact, even if they didn't listen to it, they probably have a clue that I met Darth Vader because that was the name of the podcast. I went to this I went to this charity thing at Bristol Zoo. David Prowse, who played Darth Vader, was there and I sat with him and all lovely. Yes. I did not tell the whole story. I held something back because I wanted to talk about it with you. And I have since talked about it with you. And I wanted to talk about it with a few other people. And I'm now in a position to tell the whole story. Please do. Because David Prowse was there in support of the zoo's charitable endeavours. And his contribution was he was donating an opportunity to watch the original Star Wars movie with him and 20 of your friends at a sort of VIP screening held at the zoo and then have a and a with him afterwards and just hang out. Mm -hmm. So watch Star Wars with Darth Vader and then hang out with him. Pretty cool prize. That is a pretty cool it prize. It is a pretty cool prize. Now, I, got, I was a bit excited by the whole night and I was sitting with Darth Vader and we were all dressed up in tuxes and I'd had a few wines and... Everything was good. And I had thought about it a bit. And then when the auction came, I suddenly had a rush of blood. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is, I'm going to go for it. This is your moment. This is my moment. I've always wanted to be like that cool guy that just subtly puts his hand up at the auction and, mm -hmm. you know, just does the nod mm -hmm. and gets the look from the auctioneer. And it's like, you know, feel like you're, feel like you're pretty important. Right. So that's what I did. <laughs> and I won the auction. <laughs> oh, yeah? I won the auction. So... Uh, so I've got this, which is kind of funny in a way, because I've seen Star Wars a million times and I spent all night with David Prowse. So, and I asked him anything I wanted. But anyway. I don't think, I don't think that auction was, was aimed at people who've never seen Star Wars. No. I think that auction was aimed at people who've seen it multiple times. I know, I know. But because I'd sat next to David Prowse and his wife, I kind of, you know, the novelty of getting to spend a lot of time with him maybe shouldn't have appealed to me so much. But I did enjoy his company so much that that, that actually enhanced the, the prize in my eyes. Mm -hmm. But I did, I did bid on it with an agenda if I won. Mm -hmm. And now that I have won, it was time to deliver on that. And I've discussed it with you and I've discussed it with a few other important people, including David Prowse himself. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a position to partially reveal the plan. And that plan is... We are going to make available a selection of seats at this screening and you are going to come along yep. being a Star Wars fan and I am going to be there yep. and David Prowse will be there. So we're going to say it's a chance for Hello Internet listeners who want to come and watch Star Wars with you and I mm -hmm. and with Darth Vader himself. Come and hang out with us. When we make these 
tickets or positions or seats available. However, we do that. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do that. <laughs> yes, yes, we have not. We have not figured out a lot of details here. We don't know yet. But whatever, whatever we do, however we raise any money from this, this isn't to go towards the Hello Internet private jet. This is all the money from this is for South African penguins. I've spoken to the people at Bristol Zoo. And they will also organise for us all to have a tour of the zoo and look around and talk about some of the key animals, especially the penguins. This whole charity thing at the zoo is raising money for South African penguins. Uh, there's problems with South African penguins. I think basically, uh, I don't know why this happens, but it seems like the parents keep leaving their chicks to go foraging for food and well, they don't come back. And there's all these problems with these penguin chicks. And the Bristol Zoo's got this big program where they are sort of saving the chicks and saving the penguin colonies. They're trying to raise money for that. So we are going to raise more money for that. Yes. So we, I think we want to specify that the money is not going to us because what we also decided is probably the fairest thing to do is when we have decided the details, we are going to first give that information to the Patreon supporters of the show. Yes. We're not now. We're not saying that it's going to be limited to patron supporters. That is not the way it's going to work. We're just going to give them a head start on getting these tickets. However, we decide that that's that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I figure they're probably the biggest super fans anyway. So they're the people who may think that coming all the way to Bristol to watch Star Wars with us is <laughs> is a worthwhile endeavor. So yes. I, I don't know. I was figuring maybe we'd put some of them on there, and then some of them we'll talk about on the podcast or the twitter or something so yes it's not a that's not the only way to find out but it's a very good way to find out yes uh, whatever is going to happen your best chance of getting a ticket you know right away is going to be being on the on the patreon but that does not mean that that will be the only way to do it but that's why i want to emphasize that the ticket money the ticket the ticket sales themselves will be going to penguins and who doesn't like penguins monsters brady that's who doesn't like penguins I like penguins. I like penguins. I'm actually, in some ways, just hanging out at the zoo with like a bunch of Hello Internet people and you is like is is pretty cool anyway. But then getting to go and uh, then watch Star Wars with Darth Vader afterwards, that's pretty, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think that's really the selling point. <laughs> we, cool. we will happen to be there, but Darth Vader will be there. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, I'm sure if you bring along a, a Darth Vader picture or something, uh, David will sign it for you because he signs... He's pretty used to signing Darth Vader pictures, and you can bring along your uh, your iPhone or your Kindle, and I'm sure Gray will sign it for you. <laughs> yes, I'd be very happy and to sign some Kindles. I don't know what bring a bring along a piece of plane wreckage, and I'll sign that for you if you want. <laughs> Perfect. I don't know what someone would want me to sign, but I'd be I'd happily I'd happily sign anything. Did I tell you I signed a test tube? No, you did not tell me you signed a someone test tube. Brought along a, in India, the chemistry fans brought along these test tubes for us to sign. That sounds difficult to sign. That yeah, sounds difficult. It was it was difficult to sign. Yeah. Not as difficult yeah. as a t-shirt, though. Yeah, t-shirts are hardest. Mm. Really, people, iPhones. So <laughs> that's the way to go. All no, right. <laughs> but if you want to come... So there you go. Come and see Star Wars and Zoo Animals with Hello Internet and Darth Vader. <laughs> Do you think anyone will actually listen on Christmas Day? Uh, I, I don't know. Possibly people will listen on Christmas Day. I bet some people will listen on Christmas Day. Would you listen to a podcast on Christmas Day? Well, it's. It, I think I always find Christmas. I always find Christmas Day kind of strange, and that's partly because in in my family, I think I've sort of alluded to before, Christmas Eve was usually actually the the bigger day hmm. because of the the Dutch connection. In in my family, we usually. Uh, opened the presents on Christmas Eve, so we didn't open the presents on Christmas Day, yeah. and like that—that that was always the big, the big celebration was was that day, and then so for me, Christmas morning was often a much smaller event, and I always remember having this strange feeling of like almost at like twelve noon on Christmas Day, somehow Christmas is just over. It just doesn't feel like it's Christmas <laughs> anymore, and I still have that as an adult somehow that. That Christmas ends remarkably soon on Christmas Day, that feeling of, oh, it's Christmas time. And so I think there, there would be, if there are people like me, there will be afternoon Christmas Day podcast listeners. So you've done the whole morning shebang and maybe you're just, you know, you're relaxing somewhere 
possibly away from your family for a few moments of respite. And so they, they might be listening to the show. Hello, if you're listening to us. The soothing tones of CGP Grey and Brady to get festive. <laughs> yes, possibly. Possibly. <laughs> it's funny how, like, you, what you think Christmas is like and, like, your childhood Christmas sort of gets locked in. And other, the other ways that people do Christmas, like, just you never really become comfortable with other people's ways. Like, I'm the same as you, actually, for for various just family reasons. Christmas Eve was always more exciting because that's when we saw, you know, the auntie and uncle who were the ones who we did fun presents with and the fun cousins and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And then Christmas Day, we did other things. And so Christmas Eve was just always more exciting for me. But that aside, since moving to the UK from Australia, from mm-hmm. the Southern Hemisphere, like, I cannot get used to the fact, for example, that people just watch so much tv on christmas day in the uk oh yeah like like that's like the thing to do there's all these special shows on and people will eat and then watch this show and then that show like christmas day revolves around television in the uk Hmm. and that you know there are special movies that they release on the day like you know the latest harry potter film will cut will be premiere on christmas day and things like that and in australia where it's sunny and you just go outside and go to the beach and play cricket and I think if I turned a television on in Australia on Christmas Day, well, I would have got in trouble as a kid. But also people would just think you're like some kind of weirdo. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering now that when uh, when I was younger, my family, for two out of the three Lord of the Rings movies, we went and saw them on Christmas Day. At the cinema? Yeah, because they, they came out on, I think, on, if, I don't know if it was on Christmas Day or just slightly before Christmas Day. But so, yes, uh, there were a couple of watching Lord of the Rings on Christmas days in my family. The other thing that's crazy to me that it seems so many people in the UK do is see their friends on Christmas Day, like go to the pub or go out with their friends in the evening. Mm -hmm. Like to me, like Christmas Day was like, Christmas Day was the one day of the year practically that I was banned from seeing my friends, like my (laughs) my next door neighbours who I wanted to play cricket with, you know, every day of my life or you know, go swimming with and all my mates and all my school friends. Mm -hmm. Like this was the one day of the year we were all kind of told, no, you're not allowed to play cricket with Stephen and Adam today. Right. They're going to see their family. You're going to see your family. This is a family day. Right. You know, this is the one day of the year you can give your friends a rest and put your family first. But here in the UK, almost everyone I know, like they do the family stuff during the day and then it's off to the pub with friends. Hmm. Is that, is that just me? It's funny living in, living in London, I've known many more immigrants, I think, than English people over mm. my time. So I, I don't necessarily have a good sense of what it is that English people do on their, their Christmas day. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a bit more, I'm a bit more ingratiated into England, aren't I? For you are. Reasons, you are. So. You've gone native is what you've gone. I have gone a bit native. <laughs> Look, while we're talking about Christmas, let me change the order of things a bit because things are getting Christmassy. And yeah. you promised to send me a picture of your Christmas tree. Uh, yeah. You have not done this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I What's going on? Are you ashamed? No, I just, I honestly, I just, it, it hasn't crossed my mind. I can message my <laughs> wife in the other room right now if, if you want to picture the Christmas tree. Yep, yeah, I want it. I want it now during the show. You want it right now? Okay. I want it, I want it during the show. Let me message the missus. Get her onto it. I want to see this tree. Well, I was going to, I was going to give you a harder time about that. I, did, I don't know if I told you, we, we, we went and chose our tree. Mm-hmm. We like... It's something we, we've done it a couple of times now, going and cutting it down ourselves, like choosing it and then like executing it in the forest. Hmm. Have, you, uh, have you ever done that? When I was growing up, we always had a plastic tree. We never had a real tree. Yeah. And with my wife now, she is the one who introduced the notion of real trees, which I think I touched right. upon last time, <laughs> which is something it would never occur to me to do. Yeah. And we have not done the go into the forest and pick out a tree just like they do in the movies thing, mainly because we're living in central London. And so it is a little bit difficult to get out into the forest. <laughs> and so we, we always end up just going to a couple of places that are that are nearby and picking up some pre-selected trees. Pre-executed. So, pre-executed trees. Yes, that is that is what we do. Well, next year you come out with us and do it and you can come and you can come and help us choose a tree because it's so much fun. That sounds like a long day. That sounds like a long day. It's not. It's really easy and really fun. It's really good. They've got, it's like a farm, you know, it's a tree mm-hmm. farm. And mm-hmm. the one we went to this year was really good because they put ribbons on the ones you're allowed to cut down. Mm-hmm. And um, 
because you know some of them they're growing for future years Mm -hmm. and at this particular place every single one of them has like a name like Mm -hmm. they've given a a fun name so you and the name colors your choice in some ways as well as what the tree looks like wait 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 hold on Hold on. They've given the trees individual names. Yeah. Like this tree is called Tom. This yeah. This well, the one we Mike. ended up with was called Spencer. Uh huh. So we chose Spencer, but there are all sorts of cool names and uh, yeah. That sounds it's, exhausting. Someone has to name all the trees. I'm, I'm envisioning it, a forest full of trees. That's a did, lot of names. Well, it's not like a. It's not like a. You know. Return of the Jedi type forest that just stretches forever. It's a bit more. But even still, it's gonna be like I, I often go to IKEA and I marvel at all the names in Ikea. I think, oh, this is exhausting coming up with names for all of these products. I'm just envisioning like how many items are there in Ikea versus how many trees in this forest that you're going to. Yeah, no, you're right. It would, I would say he would have had to come up with a few hundred names at least. Yeah, I I often think that about people that run dog sanctuaries as well when they've got to give all the dogs names. I find they tend to recycle their names a lot. Yeah, they must recycle the names. Yeah. They must recycle the names. I've got the picture of your Christmas tree. There you go. So, all right, what do you think? Are Are you okay with this? I have to say i like it yeah you've done well it's 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 quite close to our style as well so uh i can't uh, even begin to tell you how dissatisfied i am with all the lights on this christmas tree no i like the lights it's it's got a nice balance but also a touch of randomness i think you've done well you do need it you do need a touch of randomness if it's too even it looks all wrong yeah but for, for some reason we have i don't know what this is i don't know what this is but we we bought some christmas tree lights mm. and okay right i'm gonna get some christmas tree lights that are in a string, yeah. right? So I can a- arrange this. Now, have you gotten Christmas tree lights? They come in a, in a loop. Yes, you know what we've I'm got, talking we've about. We've got right? one that's a string and one that's a loop. Yeah. So some of our our strands are these these loops, and I don't under, I don't understand the reasoning for this. I don't understand why this is the case. And so I think I think we have two strands that are loops and two strands that are single strands, like mm. you know single strands in the way sanity deems it should be. Yeah. And as a result of this, I have had a heck of a time trying to balance the lights to my satisfaction. And I find myself sitting on the couch looking at the tree and then just getting irritated because it doesn't look right. So I go over and try to adjust it. But because of this, the the loop loop strand disparity, I am not able to achieve satisfaction. So I am unhappy with the distribution of I mean, lights, in this but... picture you've sent me, it looks like the lights at the top of the tree aren't actually switched on or I can't see them very well. Uh, so... I think that's just because of the lighting in the room. Okay. I think so I can't, I can't completely judge on how well you've done the lights, but... From what I can see, I, I find it quite pleasing. Yeah. It's... I do notice, is the top of the picture cut off or is there no star on the tree? Nothing on top. We have had some star difficulties this year. Do you want to share with the group? <laughs> no, I don't, need to, I, don't, I don't need to share every tiny detail of my fussiness about everything. <laughs> this is not necessary. We can just leave it that, it that star acquisition was not satisfactory this year. Uh, however, you sent me a picture of your Christmas tree, yeah. and I, I again, you, you, oh, you, I'm going to say this, and you're going to take it the wrong way, but I, but take it the way I mean it, Brady. All right. Your decorations, your star is never something that I would pick for myself, but I think it looked absolutely great on your tree. Would you care to describe the star on your tree and, and your tree decorations? Well, I find it weird that you call it a star, because clearly it's like an angel. Yeah, wait, wait, the uh, thing at the top of the tree, no matter what it is, is a star. Ah, uh, see. No, 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 no. This is You're getting into my Christmas tree baggage here. No, it's it, whatever it is at the top of the tree, it's a star. No, no. I, and- I, saw, I saw a Christmas tree decoration, I think on Reddit, presumably on Reddit, which was somebody had a, a King Kong at the top of his Christmas tree that had a, a, an airplane in one hand uh, and... <laughs> I, f- yeah. I forget the actress's name in the other hand. So even if there is a King Kong at the top of your tree, it is still a star. No. I would refer to that as a star. No. Why am I wrong about this? Well, I have I have childhood issues here. <laughs> okay. Um, my my mum was the chief decorator of our Christmas tree and um, was very... Uh, she's a very particular woman and likes things how she likes them. Mm-hmm. So we were, we were given only a minimal role in Christmas tree decorating. We were mm-hmm. allowed to put a few decorations on at strategic places. And if they were around the back, maybe we got away with it, but otherwise they might end up getting moved. And my mum had a real preference for a star star at the top of the tree, you know, a pointy star, mm-hmm. a star of Bethel. No, sorry, she, I got that completely wrong. <laughs> Sorry, man, this is just, this is, I'm so scarred by this, I can't even tell the story. She had a very strong preference for an angel mm-hmm. as the star. Okay. She liked putting an angel up there. Okay. 
I always wanted a star as in a star star because I thought, you know, that's the more cliched one and that's what's on Christmas cards and it's the cliche. Right. And I guess when you're young, you just want to fit in and you want everything to be the same as everything else and you want your Christmas tree to be the same as everything else. And um, so I was always like, why can't we have a star at the top of the tree? Why do we always have to have an angel? Because I thought, you know, an angel was a bit square and, you know, I don't know. I just didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I wanted a star. So anyway... But my mum always wanted the angel. Later on, I think maybe she relented one or two years, but generally not. So now that I am a grown-up and I have my own Christmas tree, mm -hmm. my my wife's a way better decorator than me. And again, she takes the lead role and I'm, I'm pretty much on the bench and I get to put the odd decoration on and maybe get sidelined if I'm not doing well. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I put my foot down on was I'm a grown-up. I'm having a star star at the top of my tree. None of this angel stuff. That was like, that was me, you know. I've got I've got my own house now. I can have a tree on top. I can have a star on top of the tree. Um, so every year so far, we have had a traditional star. Mm -hmm. This year, my wife said, "Actually, I prefer angels." Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I was pro I'd probably done something wrong, or I was in the doghouse, so I wasn't in a position to exert any authority. Mm -hmm. So she said, "We're having an angel, whether you want it or not. We're mm -hmm. not having a star." So I'm yet again. Stuck with an angel on top of the tree when what I really, really want is a star. So when you saw that angel at the top of the tree and said, oh, I like your star, mm -hmm. you were cutting me deep because I want a star and I haven't got one. I'm very sorry, Brady. <laughs> sorry, man. I'm sorry about that story. <laughs> I, you know, I, un I understand. I understand. You know, it's yeah. just when, when you're grown up, you want things your own way and sometimes you don't get it. And it's sad. Let's talk about... Star Wars. Now, now, can I just say something right off the bat? Okay. A lot of people seem to think that I forced you into doing something you didn't want to do by watching that trailer. But you did. You did. Y you have never in your life done anything you don't want to do, as far as I can tell. And you sure as heck have never done anything I've asked you to do that you didn't want to do. So any suggestion that mm. Grey watched that, you, you wanted to watch it. You just, like me, when I come to you to make me buy tech technology products you just you wanted me to push you into it i i disagree with your assessment here i first of all it is correct that in our relationship you do sometimes as i refer to it ask me to bully you into particular situations uh i think that that is that is fair to say but with the star wars trailer i can honestly say that did we not have a podcast there is no way you could have ever talked me into watching that trailer yeah, but if I you did didn't it, want to watch I it, you... did it for the people, Brady. That's what I did it for. Not for you. I did it for our amazing audience. Well, now the people are upset. Now the people are upset about it. <laughs> Why are people... I haven't seen anybody upset. What are you talking about? I've seen lots of people saying Grey shouldn't have done it and Brady shouldn't have made him do it. And I feel like... I feel bad now. But I don't believe it. I just, you know, I just think you wanted to watch it. You, just, you don't do things you don't want to do. If, if it wasn't for the podcast, I never would have watched it. But I watched it. And how many times have you watched it since? I've watched it a bunch since. I have to say, <laughs> I've watched it quite a bunch and gone through it a little bit slow and like, ooh, what's you know, what's this? Are those pod racers in the back? Uh, and and the other thing, which was of course uh, a joy, is that I can then listen to other people talk about the Star Wars trailer. Yeah. Uh, so there was a there was a good episode of the Incomparable, yeah, that, which is a, a podcast I think you and I both listen to. Yeah, that was and good. I don't know how long, however, whatever it is, like the, the trailer is a minute and a half and they talked about the trailer for an hour and a half or so. I forget what the exact numbers are, but something like that. I love, you're like a, you're like a, you're like an alcoholic falling off the wagon. Like you watched it once and you're like, <laughs> no, nah, now I'm just going to keep watching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to watch it a bunch of times. Uh, so there was the uncomfortable thing. And then uh, of course, one of the favorites that we've mentioned a bunch of times, the, the red letter media guys did a plinket review of the star Wars trailers. I had to watch that immediately. Oh, I've not seen that. Uh, yeah, there you go. So the, the, it did, the thing that I did not want to do did open up to me a whole world of media that I could not have consumed otherwise. So that was, mm. I'm not going to lie, that was enjoyable. But the question of would I have done it on my own? Would you have been able to talk me into it if the circumstances were different? No, you would not have been able to talk me into that. Uh, I want to know what you think about something. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people sent us a uh, an image or a little video, which was the final shot of the Millennium Falcon stabilized. Yes. So uh, I don't know if people have ever seen uh, stabilized footage. The most hilarious stuff I can possibly point to you is there is an entire subreddit dedicated to Star Trek stabilized. 
And so what, just to describe for people who might not be aware, when you've seen any episode of Star Trek, there's, you know, there's always, oh, the shields have been hit, Captain, we're, you know, we're down to 40%. And the camera always shakes and everybody flies about the room, right? These, these kinds of shots. Yeah. You can feed that stuff into a computer, which will then figure out how the camera moved and basically undo that. So you can look at the scene as though through a camera that had just remained stable. And some of the Star Trek stabilized stuff is just hilarious. You cannot imagine how terrible the actors look when they are trying to fling themselves away from control panels or fall on the floor, because obviously the room that they're in isn't moving at all. And so that's a, that is the stabilized stuff. So you you, you take out the camera movement, and it, it is Star Trek stabilized is is hilarious and 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 very enjoyable. So somebody did that for the Millennium Falcon, and what it revealed was that the Millennium Falcon did not perform the maneuvers that we sort of thought it did when we were talking last time. Uh, it it just basically does a dive and pulls up. So the maneuver is much more simple than it looks when you watch the film yeah. because we were kind of thinking of it that the Millennium Falcon was spinning around and narrowly avoiding stuff and, and I think you called it, it was like a hornet. Yeah, we thought it was too nimble and agile, and a lot of people have said, no, it wasn't that agile, it was just the camera that made it look agile. Yeah, so people were sending us this this stabilized thing in, in response to that. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, my thoughts on that are even when stabilized, it is still skimming pretty close to the sand for a big old clunky mm-hmm. chip. I still think it's a fast, agile manoeuvre that it shouldn't be doing that close to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I said in the last podcast that I know it went through the asteroid belt and Mm -hmm. everyone has said it led the, you know, it led the attack on the uh, Death Star and things like that. I am aware of that. (laughs) Yeah, like like you don't know that. It's not not (laughs) like I don't know that, but I still want to think of it as a bit of an old clunker. Mm -hmm. And you think of all your best memories of the Millennium Falcon. Mm-hmm. Most of them involve it being broken on the ground or things going wrong. That is my favorite memory of the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> yeah. So let's so let's say that first. Secondly, if it takes a whole bunch of geeks on the internet to apply this stabilization to show that it's not doing something amazing, that's not an indictment on you and me. That's mm-hmm. an indictment on the filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Because the filmmaker's job is to convey an impression. And the mm-hmm. impression was that that ship was doing something awesome. Mm-hmm. And if if you can unpick it to show that it wasn't, well, so what? We're not going to be sitting there watching the film when it comes out with stabilization goggles on, so that we can know what's really going on. Yes, we can only we can only eat what we're served. Mm-hmm. And I so I think this whole look, you know, it was the camera d- doesn't cut it with me. Yeah, I, I am with you one hundred percent. And I kept thinking of this as this is cheating. That's what this is. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a phrase, uh, it comes from Futurama, and you say someone is, you are technically correct, the best kind of correct. And so to me, this is J.J. Abrams getting to be technically correct about the moves that the Millennium Falcon can do while visually conveying an entirely different feeling. Mm. I give the stabilization thing a kind of thumbs down in, in that. All right. If people have not seen it, the special George Lucas edition of the trailer is hilarious. It's good. Uh, it is It is so good. What I love about it, you can tell it is made by someone who the special editions really got under their skin. <laughs> and we were talking about it a little bit on Instant Messenger, but there was a part that I wanted to highlight to you, uh, which was the rocks over the droid yeah. um, that block your field of view. And those are not just any old rocks. Do you know where those are from in the special editions? Oh, I can't. No, I can't think. I, I actually can't think. I've only watched that special edition trailer once. So I've probably watched that special edition trailer half as many times as I've watched the actual one. Because <laughs> I think it is, it is just hilarious. The yeah. final shot with the Millennium Falcon and a million TIE fighters gets me every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. So in, in the very first Star Wars movies, when Luke Skywalker gets knocked out by the Sand People, hmm. R2-D2 goes and hides in some rocks in the wall. And in the special edition version, for just completely not understandable reasons, when they pan to R2-D2, they added in a whole bunch of rocks on the screen so that he's really hidden behind these rocks that weren't there in the original movie. And this is a perfect example of of messing with something for no reason. Who needed those rocks there? Nobody. And when you place them there, 
you also introduce a problem of how how the heck did R2-D2 get behind all of these? There's no way for him to enter. And it's just it, they just a great example of just messing with things for absolutely no to no benefit at all. Just to messing with stuff. So whoever put those rocks in front of the droid, that was a brilliant, brilliant move. And I, th- I feel like really sticks the knife in directly to George <laughs> Lucas. So come on, we've got to hurry up with this podcast, mate. You know, you've told me about this Plinkett review. I want to go and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have told me about that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's long, too. We can't stop and just, you know, no, I let know. you watch it's it. Right. So um, you know, we, yeah, we, we always get stuck on the follow up. So we've got to keep cracking on. Well, well, I just wanted to point something out. Uh, a video, a number file video of mine made quite a while ago that we've mentioned on the podcast before because you've said it was kind of an audition for the podcast, unbeknownst to me. It was It was your audition. You did not know it. It wasn't the first time I'd, you'd appeared in one of my videos. You'd helped me out a few times before, but this was a, this was a longer one. I'd, help, I'd helped you out under very different circumstances. Yeah. So anyway, the one we're talking about mm-hmm. um, just passed, last week passed a million views Mm -hmm. so i thought it was a good chance to bring it up just to get under your skin again because the video is titled (sighs) numbers confuse americans yeah Yeah. (laughs) and you hate that title along with many other people to be fair listen the thing okay so people if people watch the video the whole video is it's about two american expats one of which is myself and we are talking about differences. Gray's not in the video, by the way, before you all get excited. It's an animated Gray, so don't think you're going to go there and see his face. There's yeah, who, no spoilers. Uh, who, who did you have do the animations for that? That was Pete McPartland. Oh, yes, that's right. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah Pete did a good job on those animations. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Two but the, expats. The, yeah, so the video is, is two American expats, and we're talking about things in Britain with the number system that confuses us. And it just just some common things that that if you, if you ever live abroad, you run into this kind of stuff. Like the phone numbers don't have the same rhythm that you're expecting from your home country. This kind of stuff. But you titled the video "Numbers Confuse Americans," which is pretty much what you said about five seconds ago, except with a whole lot of qualifiers attached. But yeah, okay. But the correct title of this video should be "British Numbers Confuse Americans," not not numbers in the abstract. Right, your, your title <laughs> implies that all Americans are baffled by the notion of numbering things. That oh, wow, how do we? We can group these things together, and can we assign them a number? I don't know. It's so confusing, right? That's that's what your title implies. Would you, would you have would you have allowed it if I'd called it numbers that confuse Americans? Oh God, that is better, but just barely. Listen, the thing that really irritates me about this is hmm. that I should go back and find our our message logs. You agreed at some point to change the title, and then you just never did. That is true. Like it was, I was gonna, I was gonna change the title. But there is a reason I haven't. You've gone back on your word, as far as I'm concerned. That's the only thing that. that I know. Yep. Yeah, okay, I accept that. There is a reason I haven't changed it, mm-hmm. and that is so many people have commented on it. That if I now change it, it would it would make all the all the conversation and comments redundant. You were just looking for an excuse not to change it. No, no, honestly, I mean, I could change it right now. It would mean nothing to me. Okay, well, if it means nothing, it means a lot no, to no, me. No, it, it would, means it would, nothing to you. Change it. Would it mean a lot to you? I I would really like you to change the title. Really? I I would. I think that 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 title is is inaccurate. All right. Inaccurate, misleading, mi- mildly slanderous towards an entire nation of people. <laughs> I just think I just think it's like you know headlines just sometimes leave out details, and I know I know we're verging on. There's a difference between clickbait and tempting headlines. Well, I don't know. Is there a difference? Maybe there's not. But um, I just think you can put too many boring words in a title, and it just becomes there. And you just got to pick a few words: numbers, confusion, Americans, and go. Oh, what's this about? And that is what it's about. It is about times when numbers confuse Americans. I think it's, this, it's, I think... it's times they're confused when they're, you know, talking to non-American people. But it's it's a bit like, you know, if if I, if I had a video of American people tripping over, like falling over, you know, steps and things and banging their heads, I would call it Americans trip over. I wouldn't, you know, that doesn't mean every American is tripping over every minute of the day everywhere they go. That just means that in this video, I'm showing you cases when Americans have tripped over. Just like in this particular video, I am showing you cases where numbers confuse Americans. No. All, to me, this, this title is over the line. All of the, <laughs> all of the relevant information is, is missing. 
right? Like your 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 tripping analogy does not make any any, any sense in this in this case. I'm, I'm, I was I was trying to pull it up. My internet is being ridiculously slow for some reason. But I'm trying to think about what my most my, my most misleading headline might be, mm. uh, and that might be the "This video will hurt" headline. Yeah, definitely. But I would argue that that headline is necessary for what that video is trying to accomplish. I will let people watch it if they have not seen it. I'll put a link in the show notes. And you decide, people, on the Reddit if you think that that title is over the line. Well, I don't think it is, unlike Brady's title, which I would say the Redditors will obviously agree is way over the line. Well, that's because so many of them are Americans. But <laughs> I, I think that part of, the, part of the fun of that video is kind of the, you know, the parochial, the divisiveness between the two sides of the Atlantic. So why not have a headline that plays to that mm-hmm. and, you know, stir the hornet's nest? Because it's, it's a bit like that. I mean, you, you're very scathing you know, in a, in a nice way about certain aspects of the way the British use numbers, like their numbering system on the streets mm-hmm. and things. And that's just kind of the game of that video. It's kind of a bit of friendly banter, dare I use the word banter. I know some people really hate that, but... If, if you say so. If you it say sounds so. like I have to change it now. I mean, it's, it's, it, falls on, it falls on how, how much you value your word, I guess, is whether or not you're going to change it. <laughs> how much you value your word. <laughs> This episode of Hello Internet has been brought to you once again by the shaving geniuses at Harry's. Harry's provide the whole shaving experience online. Well, I mean, you can't actually shave online, of course, but you can buy everything you need to do it from the Harry's website. Razors, replacement blades, creams, gels, moisturizers, go and check it all out. And all of it comes at a really great price. I've been using Harry's stuff myself and have got nothing but good things to say about them. Now, it feels that like Harry's are all about trying to take on those big shaving companies which charge what have always seemed like extortionate prices for razor blades. Harry's have got great stuff, but at a fraction of the price. In fact, it feels like the Harry's stuff is better than those other guys because, I don't know, I just like the design and the way their stuff looks. It just sort of seems a bit more mature and classy, and I mean, let's face it, I need all the help I can get when it comes to being mature and classy. Go to harrys.com, the website, for all the information, prices, and to place orders. And when you check out, enter the offer code HI, that's short for Hello Internet, and you'll get a $5 discount on your first purchase. You save money, and they'll know you're Hello Internet listeners. That's harrys.com, code HI. Normally what you'll do if you haven't already got a razor from Harry's is buy like a starter set and that comes with your first handle as well. And you can choose between this one called the Truman and the Winston. And I like the Winston because it's like this silver aluminium handle. It's really weighty and nice, really nice design. So there you go. There's my recommendation, the Winston. I'm not going to make a recommendation between gel and shaving foam. That's That seems like a personal decision to me. And then when your first blades run out, I think you get a couple to start with, obviously. You know, two or three, I think. But when it comes time to replace them, you can buy replacement blades really cheaply, buy them online, and they're really well made in Germany. So really good product, really good service, brilliant stuff, Harry's. Give them a try, and thank you so much to them for making our podcast possible. We appreciate it. I think there's only so much time we can spend talking about iPhones, Mm -hmm. and we have done it quite a bit, but I thought I would let people and you know that i have a new iphone Mm -hmm. i I think this is very exciting news so what iphone did you get i got the i put i cannot tell you how much i agonized over this well Uh, i I know because i was on the receiving end of a large number of text messages about this when you were in the store yeah but i I didn't know i didn't know what you ended up going with you you were asking for my advice and i was trying to do the best that i could i can't decide whether i followed my heart or my head i don't know which i followed Mm -hmm. Uh, But I followed one, (laughs) and it resulted in me getting an iPhone 6. Okay. iPhone 6? Yep. And How do you feel about it? After about a week or so now, week or two of use, I think I made a mistake. Oh, really? How Mm. very interesting. Now, a mistake in which direction? Too big or too small? Too big. Too big. See? Okay. Okay. I listened. It was funny because just in the build up during during the time when I was thinking about it, I listened mm. to quite a good episode of uh, I'm pretty sure it was the talk show mm-hmm. with um, I don't know who John Gruber's guest was, but they were talking about 
the iPhone 6. And they were both saying, okay, I'm happy with my 6, but part of me wishes I'd got a 5, that smaller phone. Mm. And that pretty much persuaded me. I was like, yeah, I am going to do it. I'm going to listen to the advice and, you know, take advantage of all this hindsight and get the 5. And at the last minute, I talked myself out of it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I was considering all three and I was making the case for all three and I got the 6 and for various reasons... And it's too big. Mm -hmm. I can't reach, you know, we've heard it all before. I can't reach the top. I never thought I would do this, but I am using the reachability trick where you double click the button and all the icons come down lower so you can reach them. I'm using that dozens of times per day. Oh, God, that's awful. I know. I can't. I, I thought when I heard that that was a feature, I'm like, well, you know, I think I'd rather shimmy the phone or, you know, use two hands than do that. Mm -hmm. But I have my way. I like holding a phone and I don't mm -hmm. want to change it. And mm -hmm. the reachability is something I'm using. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm i not that pleased. I'm not that pleased with it. But I just, you know, the thing is I bought two. I bought one for my wife at the same time and mm -hmm. she wanted the iPhone 6. Mm -hmm. And for the record, let me say she is in love with the iPhone 6. She thinks it's the best thing ever and she mm -hmm. thinks it's crazy that I don't like it. So mm -hmm. in the interest of fairness, she loves it. But I, I would guess just based on that, that this is similarly with my wife, that your wife probably keeps it, one, in a handbag, hmm. and two, uses it one-handed much less. That I, I, don't, I can only imagine that's the case because she's yeah. got smaller hands than me, but um, she loves it. And I, I think my problem was I couldn't bear the thought of her having a more powerful, high memory <laughs> phone than me. I actually think that's what it was, <laughs> which, is, which I know is silly. <laughs> not in a competitive jealous kind of way no no you know, I'm, it's not I'm like laughing, that with your wife i'm laughing but... because i could understand that <laughs> yeah i just yeah i think if she had a if knowing that she had a higher spec phone than me just would have felt wrong somehow uh -huh, and uh -huh. and as a result i've ended up with the wrong phone okay so i i have i have one more question for you because this relates mm -hmm. to something that i want to say because i'm imagining there are it's christmas day there are probably several people who have received iphone 6s oh, yeah, of course, from yeah. santa claus yep are you using the phone with a case so far yes I, ha I did get the leather case my my very strong advice because i complained a lot about the six on one of our earlier shows and mm. you know this these same kinds of things and i can't remember when but at some point i decided i'm going to try it without the case mm. and it only makes a difference of a couple millimeters on either side and on the bottom but i have 100 percent found that this is the difference that makes a difference and it, it changed my phone from kind of infuriatingly just too large to barely within acceptable tolerances in terms of size. I still think it's a little too big, but I find it surprisingly more usable without a case. So if there's anybody out there who has an iPhone and they're, they're getting driven crazy by the one-handedness, I really recommend trying it without the case. The case is nice, though. Like it's 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 well done. The problem the problem with the case is that, or I should say, the problem going caseless is that they have made this completely smooth, slippery stone that that is like trying to use it as a camera is much harder to hold it. Like there's mm -hmm. there's no place to kind of to grip it, and I am much more concerned about dropping it. And I like just using it around the house. I find that if I'm if I'm not paying attention, I do just drop it much more. Like I'm on the couch, so I'm not really concerned about dropping it because it's going to drop on a carpet or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I definitely drop outside. I haven't dropped it, but I, I have made this trade off that I think without the case, it is much more usable one handed. But I, I still it, it it's only a few millimeters. But I swear, if if Apple made a phone that was just like five millimeters shorter on the diagonal, I think I would be totally fine with it. But it's just a tiny bit too big. Mm. I'm just so um, brutal on my possessions, though. And if I don't have a case, I just know I'm going to scratch it really badly. And at, at the moment, I can put it in my pocket and sort of have the glass always facing away from things that might scratch it, like wallets and keys and coins and things like that. I know I don't run a, I don't run a pocket regime like yours, so these are factors <laughs> I need to take into account. But I just, I just don't take care of stuff. There are a lot of hilarious videos of people putting the iPhone 6 through stress tests. You have to realize that the surface of the phone is not glass. It is not as shatterable as you think it is. And so there are some quite amazing like drop tests. There's a video of some guy who sets the phone on fire. It is not impervious, but it is harder to damage than you 
think it is going to be mm. if, if you drop it. I'm not worried about dropping it. I'm not worried about shattering it. I just don't want to have a scratch on the screen. See, now this is interesting because you and I are very different this way. I used to be like you, Brady. Mm. I used to be very fussy about my devices and not having scratches on them. But you can decide not to be this person, not to care if there are scratches. I made this decision and I'm telling you, it's a much better life. All right. Yeah. Uh, t- uh, one thing though, and I know the 5S has this, but I did. I had a 5 before. The thumb recognition, life-changing. Oh yeah, without a doubt. That is mm. one of the best features mm. they've ever introduced. It mm. completely changes the way you use the phone. Yeah, it, it makes getting into it so much quicker now. And, but then it makes the frustration of not being able to reach the icons that much more frustrating because I can, I can get to that frustrating point so much quicker. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. I think we got away with keeping the iPhone 6 reasonably short. And yeah, you're that, right. If, it's, if this is a Christmas episode, it probably is a good time to talk about the phone again. So yeah. And I'll, oh, I'll, one last one last quick thing. You know about the, the, uh, the back gesture on the phone? No, probably not. What's that? Okay. So well, the other nice thing about not having a case, just before I forget, is that if without the case, there most but not all, but I'd say 80% of apps, if there's any kind of back feature, like on a podcast app you want to get from the podcast back to the main list, or mm-hmm. on the browser you want to go to the previous page, if you swipe with your thumb from off the screen on the left-hand side, kind of across the phone, mm-hmm. that will do the back gesture. And so you don't need to hit the back button all the time. And that is the one place where the rounded edge of the phone is quite nice. And a case totally ruins that feel of sliding over the edge of the phone. I would still say that the rounded edges are not worth it for the the nice feel of that back gesture. But if you are frustrated with constantly reaching towards the top, just be aware that the the left to right swipe across the phone is back gesture in almost every single application. That's pretty geeky. It's not that geeky. It's pretty geeky. It's not that geeky. I think it's just it's how to use your phone. So, Hello Internet was named, was it like, was it one of the top or the best or the favorite or the something podcast, you know, in, in the list of 2014, the iTunes, Apple people? I don't know. You do this. I don't know what I'm talking about. You do it. <laughs> I, always love, I always love your, not, your non-specificity of lots of these things. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but yes, we uh, we have been honored and being selected as one of the best new podcasts of 2014 by Apple. Uh, So this means that at the top of the iTunes store, if you're in the podcast section, there's a big banner for the best of 2014. And we are listed on there with a bunch of other really great podcasts. So that is uh, is quite an honor to be selected for that. How did this happen? Is this some administrative mistake or? (laughs) I have no idea how it happened. I, I just discovered it accidentally. Do we get a gold button or a trophy or anything? I don't know if they send trophies, but if they do, I promise that it will go to you. <laughs> if we if we ever win any awards for Hello Internet, if we win Pulitzer Prizes, Nobel Peace Prizes, <laughs> any of these kinds of things, if we win them, yeah. you can keep them all, Brady. Really? That is my promise to you. You can't keep the money if it's a Nobel Prize. <laughs> all right, we split the money. Yeah. But... You know, if there's a golden button or some kind of statue of a stylized person holding an object or whatever these things are, Hmm. you can have them all. And I'll be happy to let you have them all. You know I'm sending my YouTube gold button away at the start of January. I did not know that. Where is your YouTube gold button going? I am sending it to the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, California, the spiritual home of number five. And they're going to put it on the wall up there because oh. more people will see it there and it will, it will bring more pleasure than in my dusty old office. Yes, I imagine not very many people see it in your office. No, I don't even see it because it's not actually in my office. It's in sort of a secondary office. So. <laughs> um, you have another office for all this stuff. <laughs> I kind of do, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, all right. it's not as messy. It's all not like of messy. your things have their own home office. <laughs> yeah. No, you'd, you'd like it. Well, no, you wouldn't, but you would say you liked it. Like it's, you know, you'd be polite about it. I, I might not be polite about it. <laughs> no, I think you will. I think, I think it's your kind of room. I've never shown you that room, but uh, a picture of it. But you Sooner probably. or later, I will make it to your house. Yeah, I, mean, I know you will. I know you will. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, Apple iTunes. Um, yes, thank are, you very much. Have you noticed like a huge r- rush on sort of people listening to the podcast as a result? Have you know servers been collapsing and? Uh... Uh, it's you know it's a funny thing. The the 
po- the world of podcast analytics of knowing how many subscribers and how many listeners you have mm. is much fuzzier than the YouTube world. We are we are completely spoiled by YouTube and oh. You drown in statistics on YouTube. Yeah, I, I think you have also discovered they now have a real-time feature, which is incredibly addictive yeah. to be able to see how videos are performing right now. Or if, if you link to things, you can see if there's a spike in traffic. Y- YouTube spoils us with data. Yeah. And I find the podcast world, the data is just terrible and vague, and it's hard to know precisely how many listeners and how many subscribers there are. That I, I end up just not checking it very much. I know, it, I know at the moment that we tend to get between 50 and 60,000 listens per show. Mm. But I, I honestly, I don't, I don't check the numbers all the time because I just think like, oh, I have no idea. I have no idea how, how precise this data is. But that's, that's our guess. So. But then people will listen on YouTube as well to the, you know, behind the, the other ones. Are they, or do you think they're the same people listening again? I have no idea. And no. also the, the way that the, our limited analytics work, I know that almost certainly things are being undercounted because for boring reasons that people don't care about depending on how they listen to the show it may or may not count as a listen so that's why it's just it's very strange and uh again we're just we're just spoiled from youtube i love all of youtube's data and it can be a little bit too addicting yeah Uh, so with the podcast who knows who knows who knows who's listening it could just be your parents it could just be a couple people who are pretending to be lots of people on the reddit is the way it could be Well, some, well, let me talk to you about something that's been in the news because you put a little tweet up before we came on air, if I can say we're on air, yeah. asking if there was anything people wanted to talk about. And lots yes. of people wanted us to talk about the Sony hack. So I said to mm. you on a you know, message, oh, do you, do you want to talk about it? And you said something to me that I refuse to believe. Okay. You do not know what, it, what that is or what that means. T- to back up, I, I, I do often tweet out, that we're recording the show and and to see what people want us to talk about. Almost every time I do this, I regret it because (laughs) I I have the same experience, which is whatever has kind of happened like today in the news people want to talk about. And as we've mentioned on the show before, I just, I don't really follow the news. And and so almost always it is a list of things that I just, I have no idea what any of this stuff is. This has been going for like two weeks. This isn't something that happened in the last 20 minutes. This is like, this has been one of the biggest news stories in the world for the last two weeks, I would say. Well, the problem is I have also been in uh, kind of isolation mode trying to get a video out, right? So even even my, my my normal connection to the outside world for the past two weeks has been really clamped down uh because i was i was rushing to hit a deadline so the reason i'm surprised like i think it's great that you do that and i I really respect it Mm -hmm. um and i'm jealous of it but the reason i'm surprised in this particular case is this is a story that just ticks every gray box of something you would be interested in well why don't you tell me about it i feel a bit silly telling you about it because it's a bit like it's a bit like it's such a big thing it's like i feel like Everyone will be listening, which is which is what happens in a podcast. Uh-huh. Everyone's listening, and like it's like I'm ex- it's like explaining to someone, you know, what nine eleven was or something. It's like where do I, you know? It's just so famous that it's a big. But maybe in two or three weeks, it'll be a forgotten story, and people will think I'm silly. But Here's, before we, before we take any steps further, presumably is not actually a nine eleven style event because I would have heard about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. But but like. I don't know, we've talked about the news so much, but I would say just in general, I have this conversation with people all the time that people forget how many, quote, important stories pass through their brain in a year. That's true. There's always something that's supposed to happen, and it always gets forgotten a couple weeks later. That's true. There's there's never any point in the year where you don't go, oh, what's this or what's that? And I I have had conversations with people sometimes where where they'll say, like, oh, I can't believe that you're not following the news about whatever. And and sometimes it sounds really heartless depending on what the whatever is, but my point is always the same. Like, almost everything will be forgotten, three months max, and that is almost always the case. So there's always something going on. That is true. So again, like I may be sounding incredibly callous now, depending on whatever the Sony hack thing is. <laughs> yeah, I don't, no, no. I don't know, but but it's. I, I guess I, I want to just hammer home this point because as soon as you tune into this fact, you can kind of see the news in a very different way and and try to think about how many stories have have passed through your mind in the past year, which all of which were presented as 
incredibly important in the moment. Yeah. And easily 80% of them don't make any difference in a month's time or two months time. Yeah. They just don't matter. I mean, I probably it was probably also a poor choice for me to say, to compare it to 9-11 in that way. The re- I was making the comparison more in the context of, I feel silly explaining something that feels famous at the moment. And yeah, that no, was like yeah, the most but, famous news story I could think of. But I, I'm, presu- yeah. I'm presuming that, you, yeah, that you meant it in a terms of like the yeah. amount of coverage that it has yeah. received. Yeah. Let me tell you what happened. And I find it hard to believe that after a couple of sentences, you're not going to say, oh, yes, I know about that. Okay. But anyway. Let, let, let's lay it on me. Let's find out. Okay, here we go. I'm getting, uh, once again, I'm getting nervous because I really hate surprises. Well, I also feel, I feel more nervous because I'm explaining something so, that's so famous <laughs> at the moment that people are going to jump on me and say I've done it wrong. But, okay. Because well, I do your, you know. do your best. It's All fine. Right. Sony Pictures have been making a film that's about to be released called mm. The Interview. Okay. It's a comedy film. And the premise is, I think, two guys are given the opportunity to interview uh, Kim Jong is it Un or the, the current leader of North Korea? Uh, yeah, Kim Jong Un is the yeah. current leader, I believe. They get, they're, they're given the they're given access to him. So the CIA approach these these guys who, who I get the impression are kind of dopey guys and aren't that you know switched on, and see this as an opportunity to assassinate him, and then these guys go to North Korea and something ensues and maybe some assassination attempt takes place, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was this film. And it seems that the film was quite, the the imminent film was going to upset North Korea. Mm -hmm. And then Sony Pictures and Sony itself was the victim of this incredible computer security breach. They got hacked unbelievably thoroughly. Everything got released, all the executive emails that they've been sending to each other where they're kind of, you know, slagging off Hollywood stars and saying, you know, what they don't like about Angelina Jolie and all that. All that stuff got accessed. All financial details about how much actors on different films got paid compared to each other. Mm -hmm. Rough cuts of films that haven't been released. Apparently a, a draft of the script of the next James Bond movie. Everything they wouldn't want to come out you can think of got taken Mm -hmm. And then released and distributed and has become public knowledge and has gone everywhere like wildfire. And Mm. the hackers have made it clear it's because of this this film. All the speculation was that North Korea was behind it because they have a history of hacking, this kind of hacking terrorism. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there was a lot of talk, did they do it or did they get someone to do it for them? And Mm -hmm. in the last day or two now... The Americans, the CIA, are saying we're we're pretty sure it was North Korea. They're coming out and saying it was it was it was them. Hmm. On top of that, um, North Korea have praised the hack, but have said it wasn't them. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of that, this film, which was going to come out on Christmas or Boxing Day, the hackers then started saying we're going to do more, and we're warning you not to be in a cinema watching this film when it comes out in, and they even made allusions to 9-11 like they made threats hmm. so all these cinemas got nervous and started saying well we're not going to show this film because we can't guarantee security and all that sort of thing and then Sony have pulled the film and said okay we're not going to we're not going to release the film which a lot of people have really condemned as kind of cowing to terrorism and this terrible moment for free speech and and that's that's launched a whole bunch of stories in itself. So there's all sorts of things going on with this story. The complacency of, you know, security at big corporations, state-sponsored hacking, and then, you know, free speech issues. So all this stuff's been going on. The president's been talking about it and stuff. This isn't kind of a little fringe story. This has been like one of the big stories in the world in the last hmm. couple of weeks. And it t- because it touches on so many things you find interesting... I thought you'd be all over it. Obviously, you're not. And I understand why, but... Okay, so here, here is the situation that I'm in. This is often the situation when news stories come up. Yeah. I am familiar with the phrase, the interview. Yeah. And pulled. Yeah. So I have, I have seen headlines possibly on Reddit. Yeah. That some movie called The Interview was pulled. Yeah. But that that before you before you started telling me about stuff, that was the full extent of my knowledge. I couldn't have told you anything about what the movie was or any any of these other details. Yeah. And that this is often what I mean by even if you try not to follow the news, stuff still makes it through. 
Hmm. But but none of the details of this happened to make it uh, through, as, as you refer to it, as my, my bubble yeah. uh, this time around. So the, the interview, that, that does sound familiar and it being pulled, but I didn't know any of the details about the hacking. And so that does, that does sound like quite a big story. Just going off on the details that, that you have told me, it's, <laughs> it sounds like a terrible decision on Sony's part yeah. to pull it. If I, I feel like if I was the CEO of Sony... I would release the movie for free on the internet. Would be, yeah, that's would be a lot of people have call. suggested that. I think I think overall the the position has been that it was a bad decision by yeah. Sony. That seems to be. I think even I think even maybe the president said it. I can understand concerns for movie theaters not wanting to show it if there's been threats. Like I think that's a more difficult conversation to have. Yeah, but. You don't you don't give in to terrorists. Do you know what that you know that was my that was my reaction to it as well. And that remains that remains my instinctive reaction to it. Uh, my, my I feel like the only response is screw you. Otherwise what? North Korea gets to dictate all movie plot lines from now on with Sony. Yeah. You know, that Sony has to run everything by North Korea. Like that that is the only that is the only conclusion to this kind of kind of action. And so you have to say, all right, you released a whole bunch of embarrassing stuff about us. That's terrible. We wished it hadn't have happened. But you are not going to dictate our actions. That's that's kind of like well, the 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 you know you don't negotiate with terrorists philosophy. Yeah, is is exactly that. You have a choice. You're going to let somebody control your actions, or you're not. And the only sane sane thing to do is go with the or not, even if that means that there are there are costs. You don't let other people dictate your actions. So. I do. Anyway. I have read a couple of interesting responses taking a slightly, well, not a different perspective, but pointing out all the ways in which America has at least bent to the fear of terrorism. I mean, anyone who has been to an airport in the 2000s and anyone who had ever been to an airport before the 2000s would notice a slight difference. That's not even remotely comparable. Well, I think it is comparable. It's all like we, we, won't, we won't live in fear. We won't let you affect our lifestyle. Oh my goodness! How much? How much has the fear of terrorism affected lifestyle in the last fifteen years? Unbelievably, people happily will, will do go th- jump through all these ridiculous hoops at airports and all these other things that have happened since since you know nine eleven and things like that. And people say nothing about it, and all these laws that have passed, and all these actions that have happened, and things that have happened. And it's like you know people are just swallow the pill, and you pull a movie. And suddenly you pull this like flippant comedy movie and suddenly it's like, we must not give an inch to these people. Like, um, there is a slight contradiction. I do. I do see what you're saying. I do see what you're saying there. I, I don't think that the airport comparison is an apt one, hmm. mainly because to me that, that, that seems like a, like a different, a different kind of reaction because the terrorists did not say, Oh, by the way, this is like a Merry Christmas episode, everybody. We're going to talk about terrorism <laughs> on Christmas. The terrorists did not say, we want you to install these security features. Like This is a, this is a, a, like a kind of action you take in reaction to how the world is. It's, it's not the same thing as a kind of direct command from somebody who's threatening you, saying, we want you to perform action X, and if you don't perform action X... There will be consequences. That that's the kind of statement that I mean. You just you can't you can't go along with that. So I don't I don't think that the airport security one is is comparable. But I, do, I I can feel that there is an argument to be made somewhere here. And I think actually that the triviality of a movie is kind of what makes it a much easier decision. Is is to say look you should just release this movie anyway. This is not a big a big discussion about state secrets. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. It's a bad thing. They're bad people. And I feel, and a lot of people are not massively sympathetic to Sony and sort of say, well, you know, they've got a track record for getting hacked with their PlayStation problems and their lacks and big corporate people need to learn to take these things seriously. And maybe that's true. But I I don't think, and there's also been this whole, you'd love it, Gray. It's so full of nuanced arguments. There's this other massive argument about whether or not the media is being too complicit in this. And when all these like gossipy emails about, from Sony executives about Hollywood stars, like should the media just not report that stuff and give the oxygen to the to the to what the terrorists want? Because th- this stuff getting hacked doesn't matter so much if the media don't then say, woohoo, all this stuff's public domain let's tell all these gossipy stories and compare salaries and have all these bitchy comments between people and 
what's the, where, what should the media do here? Because the media is like condemning the hacking, but they're also saying, well, now this stuff's public. You know, we're free to report it. We're obliged to report it, they say. Yeah, 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 well. I, I don't even know how to... I feel like self-respecting places would not do that. Um, yeah. But obviously most of the news is, as we've discussed many times, is not self-respecting. And they want things that are easy, that will generate lots of views. And this is just the the easiest, most view-grabbiest kind of thing to do. And that is the nature of the beast. And that, that that's obviously just what they're going to do. And it makes total sense for them to rabble-rouse with one hand and say, oh, isn't this terrible, this ho- terrible hacking? Stay tuned to us about the latest details about all the terrorism threats from North Korea. And oh, by the way, let's also talk about the salaries of all of these people. Isn't it great that we have access to all this information? It's no surprise, not surprising at all to me that that you would get both sides of this from an organization that is structured the way most news organizations are structured. So can I, add, can I add one more thing? Sure. And we'll cut this if it turns out I'm completely wrong because I could be completely wrong and shouldn't stay in the podcast if I am. <laughs> but, okay. but anyway, I want to add one more thing. This it contains a spoiler for the film that won't be released. So I don't know whether you're allowed to spoil things that won't be released. But anyway, I've seen this video doing the rounds on Reddit and elsewhere, which purports to be a scene from the film, the pulled mm-hmm. film, which shows the sort of assassination death of the North Korean leader. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a dream sequence or he dies at the end of the film. I don't know what it is. But the scene is him in a helicopter being hit by a missile or something and then dying in mm-hmm. quite graphic, quite a graphic way. And, the, and it is a really graphic death. Like it's really in your face. You see him being blown up and it's like, whoa, that's, that's full on, man. And if a film was released in another country that showed that simulated death of Barack Obama or something like that, I imagine a lot of people would be upset. And it is, and and it is, it does, it is interesting. I I do wonder what would happen if the shoe was on the other foot. And I'm not saying the US would then go and hack into some other country's film companies stuff and, and do this, <laughs> but it is, it is like. It's pretty. That's pretty interesting stuff to be doing. And I know there was a documentary in the UK called "The Assassination of George Bush," and this is not unprecedented. Mm-hmm. But it is an interesting thing when you're starting to make films about the assassinations of currently living people. And I'm mm-hmm. all for free speech, and I'm not saying pull the film. And I want to see the film. I really want to see the film now because because of all this hype. <laughs> um, and I like some of the actors in it. But uh, it was interesting. I watched that, and when I saw that scene, I was like. If you're from a if you're from a really sort of conservative country that respects your leaders a bit more than some other some other countries do, uh, that's quite a thing to see. Like quite that's quite a thing. So you, I don't know. Maybe you should have a look. Tell me what you think sometime. I have not done a Brady's paper cut for a while. And no, do, yeah. And do you know what I think? What do you the think? The frequency with which I do Brady's paper cuts reflects maybe my mood and i've been quite happy the last month or two oh yeah oh yeah but this week i've been coming up with loads <laughs> oh, okay Are you grumpy with the holidays i have been a bit grumpy this week maybe maybe because my sister and family have been in town and they've and they had their my lovely little nephew with them and i'm not used to having little little boys around and affected uh-huh. my mood but he was uh-huh. great so i don't think it was him but i have come up with some paper cuts this week okay i'm only going to give you one i'll save the other ones up yeah, give me give me your best one. Though. I'm going to give you the most topical one, not the best one. And I have absolutely no doubt you won't know about this. If you don't know about the Sony hack, there's no chance you're going to know about this story. Okay. But you might not even know of this thing that exists, but it it baffles me. Okay. It is called the BBC Sports Personality of the Year. <sighs> Snore, Brady. Snore. Have, have you ever heard of this thing? I have never heard of this thing. Okay. It gets worse. This better be good. No, so, no. I am so bored already. We haven't even started talking about it. This is a, this is a contest that okay. grips. This this is a night of the year that grips the nation. Like yeah. everyone is so into this, and it's treated like such an important thing. Okay. Once a year, the BBC has this big televised TV show award ceremony, like the Oscars, where they crown the sports personality of the year from Britain. Mm-hmm. And you have to be British, and they choose a short list of like ten people 
from all different sports. So there'll be footballers and racing car drivers and cricketers and, you know, whoever has excelled that year, usually on the international stage. They pull, they, they, they have them together. The public vote on their favourite based on a, no criteria that is discernible to me. It's okay. just called sports personality of the year. There's no weighting attributed to what you've accomplished compared to what someone else accomplished. There's a public vote, and then at the end of the night, they announce the winner and they give them this trophy, and like, and really important sports people win it because Britain's got some good sports people, and they're always there, and they get up on stage. And they're really emotional and they talk about it like it's one of the greatest accomplishments of their life. Like it's it's treated like a really big deal, even by the people winning it. Uh-huh. Like, so this year it was won by Lewis Hamilton, who's a Formula One world champion, which is like a big super thing. And then he wins this meaningless British popularity contest decided by a phone poll. And I swear that gets more coverage than, he, than when he actually won the Formula One title. It's this huge thing. Everyone cares about it. It dates back to the 60s or 70s when the BBC was far more relevant. I guess it was the only it was the only TV ch- thing you could watch on TV. And so it was the center of everyone's universe and this was a big TV event. And for some reason this uh, this old-fashioned ridiculous contest just persists year after year. Mm-hmm. And it just the whole country stops for a night to see who wins this meaningless personality contest. Even the name, Sports Personality of the Year. What does that even mean? It annoys me. Thank I, you. I can, I can see that it does. Yeah. This apples to oranges competition. I know. It's like some, yeah, so the, the Formula One driver comes first and second place is a golfer and third place is a... a, a woman runner i think it was it's like it's like and i don't but it's treated so importantly even by the people winning it like they they seem sincere when they say this means a lot to me like this is a really big deal thank you can i ask you something brady yeah i don't understand why this bothers you because other people don't get it because other people think it's important (laughs) because other people think it has meaning uh-huh. And I want to I want to sit them down and say, listen, this has no meaning. <laughs> uh huh. It's like it's like if it's like if once a year, mm-hmm. the Gray family got together mm-hmm. in wherever they live, North Carolina or whatever, and they all sat in a room and they all voted, okay, who's our favorite podcaster of the year who is a member of our family? Mm-hmm. And then you won it, and uh-huh. then you made some speech like it meant something to you. Uh huh. Like. It's like, it's so, okay, it's parochial and you're allowed to have parochial things and have British only things, but then you could, there needs to be some. Oh. I, can, I, it's, it, I can feel that this really bothers you, but this to me is also the, the perfect kind of thing that I just, I cannot engage with this on any level. Nothing it's, annoys it, me <laughs> more than competitions <laughs> that and have nebulous judging criteria. Like if I'm watching a TV show and they're judging something and they say, okay, you just beat that person and they can't explain to me why that person beat the other person. But didn't you say this is, this is just a popularity contest? Yeah, but even the people voting, like what are they supposed to be voting on? It's it, never actually said. It sounds like if it's sports personality of the year, it's basically who do you like best? That's what this sounds like. But based, but <sighs> yeah, but like based on what? Like. How much people like them. That's why the people who win are really happy about it, because it has been demonstrated to them that lots of people not only appreciate their accomplishment in sport, but also like them as a person. Well, that that makes me even madder. <laughs> okay. Okay. <sighs> I, 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 can, I can offer no help here except to explain to you that you don't have to follow this. This... You don't have to participate or be aware of this popularity contest. Yeah, I know. You just kind of, kind of, I can't avoid it. And it just. I never even knew this thing existed until ten minutes ago. Yeah, you also didn't know the Sony hack existed. So I'm not using you as my yardstick for being in touch with society. <laughs> I, what I am showing you, Brady, is what is possible in life. I don't want to go as far as you. <laughs>
I can just imagine some huge terrorist attack happening in London and half the population being wiped out and you not knowing it happened and going out to get milk and like, where is it? Where is everyone? I'm sorry about the sports personality thing. I just... I can see it bothers you. But it just it just strikes me as as one of those things that is interesting to the people who participate in it and not interesting to the people who don't. And you cannot explain human interest. I just love sports so much. I'm worried that people who are following this and look at the results are going to think that this means something and like... They're gonna like they're gonna rate athletes' accomplishments based on this, and I think you gotta let it go, Brady. Well, funnily enough, the ne- the next thing we're gonna do uh-huh. is equally <laughs> completely arbitrary. So, so, having said all that, I'm about to break all the rules. Hello, Internet. This special Christmas episode is brought to you in part by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Given that it is the holiday season, I have a recommendation for you. Are you ready? Patrick Stewart narrates A Christmas Carol. I really don't need to say anything more. It is just as amazing as you're probably thinking it is right now, as almost anything narrated by Sir Patrick Stewart would be. So if you are in the holiday spirit, I highly recommend that you go check it out and you can get it for free if you go to audible.com slash hello internet. You can listen to it for free and get a 30 day trial by going to audible.com slash hello internet. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles and virtually every genre, you'll always find what you're looking for. So once again, we thank Audible for their sponsorship of Hello Internet. About a week or two ago uh-huh. was the 150th anniversary of a famous bridge in England that is very close to where I live called uh-huh. the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Uh-huh. And I think I just said something online about how much I love bridges and I really love bridges. And someone made some comments on Twitter and, and said, you should talk about bridges on the podcast. And I was like, oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. And after all your talk about flags, I thought maybe I should be allowed to talk about bridges. Okay. But I, can't, I don't really, I have nothing to say about bridges, you know. Well, just, that's going to be a problem if you yeah. want to talk about I had plenty of things to say about flags. Yeah. So. <laughs> I just really like them and I want to talk about them. But I haven't really got any sort of structured reason other than this anniversary of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. And also I did see in the news that they're building a new bridge over the Thames in London, which I thought would interest you. Oh, I a haven't new, heard about this. A new pedestrian bridge uh, near Waterloo, which oh, yeah? is going to cost... I read that it's going to cost like 175 million pounds. Cheap. That, this is bridges are expensive, aren't they? Well, you want to make sure they don't fall down. Yeah, I know. But right, if if it costs a lot to make sure it doesn't fall down, that's fine. I feel like you could build something that won't fall down for less than that. But anyway, I'm not. You know, the cheapness is not my primary concern in the construction of bridges. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not paying for it. But anyway, I'm, uh, presumably I'm paying for it with taxes. Yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. You know what? We have to spend twice as much to make it 10% safer. That's fine. That's fine. So what I thought we could do is you and I each, I gave you a bit of homework, I think earlier yeah. today. So this is a bit rushed. Yeah. But I said, let's, let's you and I each come up with our five favorite bridges, which sounds a bit like a personality contest <laughs> and a bit arbitrary, which... Uh, Okay, so I yeah, I didn't know the reason for this. You 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 did tell me to do this. Yeah. And it's a completely manufactured excuse for us to talk about bridges. Yeah, but see this was not made clear to me before. You just you told me I needed to come up with with five bridges and you did not specify why. And the the criteria was just bridges of of interest to me in yeah. some way. That that's all it was. And you had and to have been on them. You have to have used the bridge. I I had a very difficult time with this homework, I have to admit. Really? I, I, my brain would just, I had a difficult time trying to latch onto this of thinking five bridges, five bridges that I've been on. I don't know. I, I did come up with the list, but it took way longer than something should have. <laughs> and I have a few items on this list that I'm not even sure you're going to count. So we can, we can begin our conversation about bridges. If five, you so bri- five bridges of interest from each of us that we've been on. Okay. How do, do you want to do go this? first? How are we going to do it? Uh, you were the one who you you were the one who assigned me this homework. You have you have no structure at all. You just have this desire to talk about bridges in the abstract. What's your number five? No plan. Tell me your number five bridge. I didn't I didn't arrange them in order. I didn't know they had to be in preference. I just have a list of of five. Tell me one arbitrarily then. Okay. Um, 
well, uh, okay, uh, okay. If I have to, uh, the one arbitrarily I'm going to pick is the, uh, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but it's, it is the main bridge in Cologne. Uh, uh-huh. I quite like that bridge. And it has a nice little feature that people, couples write their names on locks. And then there's a, there's like a, a mesh in the bridge that people connect those little locks to. Apparently, this is a thing that is done around the world in many different locations. Yeah, they do that in Japan a lot as well, yeah. Yeah, I had, well, when I went to Cologne, I had literally never heard of this before. So this is the first place that I ever came across this. And the Cologne Bridge is a satisfactorily industrial looking. I quite like that. And yeah. then plus the locks, uh, I like that feature as well. Nice. Is that what you wanted to talk about? Yeah. Yeah, does that do it for you, That's Brady? That's good. That's a good start. It's got okay. Scott's story. You talked a bit about the bridge. It's kind of industrial looking, yeah? Yeah, it's yeah. a little industrial. All right. Nice. Okay, Brady, why don't you tell me about a bridge? I'm going to give you my number five. And this is, oh, okay. This is one that I order. think, this is one that's specially for you. Okay. I wanted to have one from Venice because Venice has got brilliant bridges. Mm-hmm. The Rialto probably being the most famous, the big one that goes over the main canal. But probably mm-hmm. the second most famous and the one I'm choosing, especially for you, is the Bridge of Sighs. Oh, the Bridge of Sighs? Okay. Yeah. And that size is in, ah, not size is in a bridge of great size. I've, I've, I've assumed when you said it's for me that that's what you meant. Yeah. So it's the Bridge of Sighs. Do you know this bridge? Have you been, have you been to Venice? I have been to Venice a long time ago. Yeah. This is a little bridge that just connects two buildings that goes over a little canal. I think it connects the palace and what used to be the prison cells. And legend has it, although it may not be entirely true, that after you'd been tried in the palace, you obviously were led over this sort of enclosed bridge to be taken or locked away or maybe executed. And you had one last look out the window of the bridge where you could see sort of the canal and the beauty of Venice. And they say prisoners would sigh before being taken away to their doom. It was one final look at the beauty that they were leaving behind. Yeah, this, sound, this, this looks familiar and that sounds like a story I might have heard when I was in Venice. Yeah. And it's a nice little cute bridge. It is a cute little bridge. Go on. Give us another one, Gray. Number four for you. Oh, sorry. I'm, just, I'm trying to look it up on the, on the Wikipedia. I don't have a number four. These are just all out of all order. Right, all right. Well, I'm just, we're just apportioning numbers to them for the sake of it. Mine are in reverse order. All right. So now I have, I have some questions of technicality here. Okay. You said we have to be on a bridge. Does it count if I've been under the bridge? I think under counts. Yes, that, yes, that counts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, because then I was going to come up short if under didn't count. <laughs> what, you've only been on four bridges in your life? <laughs> I, I, no, I was trying to come up with a list of five bridges that I could remember that were interesting in some way. <laughs> okay, so my next one then is the Great Belt Bridge, which is in Denmark. Um, I don't know if you if you know the Great Belt Bridge. Does it sound familiar which, to you? Uh, it's I don't know. I've been to Denmark and seen some pretty impressive bridges, but that one, that name doesn't ring a bell. What's going on there? The Great Belt Actually, I'll have to, I'll have to put up. Uh, I'll put a picture, and I guess all of these we're going to have pictures in the show notes. <laughs> you I'm bet. Just realizing you now. bet they will. This is the this is the bridge is in the bridge bridge, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. So the Great Belt Bridge it is in Denmark, and it is the according to Wikipedia, it is the third longest, and it connects these different Danish islands, and it is it is enormous. I never knew that this bridge existed until I happened to be on a ship that was. Uh, going through one of the there's two sort of channels that it goes over D- i didn't know that it was coming and then you can just i just saw it on the horizon it's like this thing is enormous and it and going under the bridge made it feel like it was a thousand times bigger than it actually is yeah. so uh, i thought that that was that, that is an interesting uh an interesting and slightly different bridge I it's not the br- i was on that bridge just recently when i went and this isn't the bridge bridge by the way this isn't the bridge in the tv show the bridge but which is a danish tv show but this right. this um uh, i went over this bridge to go and get my mile of pie printed oh did you yeah, did we, you yeah when i went going from copenhagen to the the factory where we did the printing oh, okay. on the train well, there we go good choice what's, see you are you're good at this am i yeah am i good at this yeah i i think you're just so excited to talk about bridges that you're happy to get whatever you can get. Do you, are you not excited by bridges? Are they not just great things, just great accomplishments and in, interesting in so many ways? Do you not think that? I, I like all markers of human domination over nature, which would include bridges. But I, I feel like you are definitely way more excited about this than I am. So I would like to hear your next bridge. Number four, I'm going to do the one that just had its birthday, the Clifton Suspension Bridge, okay. which basically looks like any other famous old suspension bridge um Uh except you know a bit smaller than what most of them are these days but this was like the 
the Trailblazer. This was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who's like the famous engineer of England and did amazing things across the country. And this is considered like his crowning achievement, although it was not finished until after he died. And it's mm. it's a beautiful it's beautiful looking. It's just it's just a classic classic looking bridge, and it's very close to my house, and I drive across it almost every week, uh, and that makes me happy. So um, it's a bit of a hometown hero for me. So I'm going the Clifton Suspension Bridge, and I won't talk any more about it because I want to hear another one from you because yours are more exciting because I don't know what's on your list. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your number three. The next one, I don't know if this will count as well, because the interesting thing is not the bridge itself. But many years ago, I went to Hong Kong and then I went to China. And when I was leaving Hong Kong and going into China, you have to pass through this bridge. But they have turned the bridge into a, a big passport check zone. And it, it was a it was a very strange and very weird experience because it was so obviously a bridge that had been enclosed. So it was a long, long passageway. And it was also just kind of a boring, like, airport interior on the inside, but also with many passport checks. I don't remember what the heck it was, but there were just, like, a lot of desks that you had to go to. And people looked at your passports, and there were, you know, military-looking guys with dogs walking around. And it was it was a strange, strange bridge because it really did feel like an airport interior that extended from one sort of kind of a country into another part of that country. So it was a, it was a strange experience, but the bridge itself is not notable. It is the things that the humans have done inside the bridge, which right. is notable. But look at this. It's a, an engineered bridge, passports, a border, mm-hmm. a bit of politics. It sounds like a grey fantasy, this place. You must have loved it. It, it, well, it was interesting. This is also a long time ago where I was not quite the same person that I am today. But it was my experience on that bridge that always made me aware of how Hong Kong is a bit of a strange place, which did eventually lead to a video. Nice one. All right. What's your next bridge? Brie? My number three is the Hillary Suspension Bridge, which is a bridge you walk over when you go to Mount Everest on the Nepal side. As you go to Mount Everest, you have to crisscross like ravines and gorges all the time. And you're always going over these suspension bridges that look a bit perilous and sort of you know oxes and cows are going over them and donkeys as well as you and it's a you know you feel like you're taking your life into your own hands that does look terrifying yeah and the the, the most oh you've got a picture of it up have you i would not cross that bridge all right well that's the (laughs) that that is a bridge that i would not cross (laughs) that's one of the better looking ones but it is very it, it is kind of the most famous and picturesque and it's the one that really starts your trip because you you cross that bridge and then you go up this really really steep uh, mountain climb like a, 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 that takes most of the day to get up to a place called Namchi Bazaar. So that kind of, even though it's the second day of the trek, that that bridge for me really marks the start of your climb up to Everest Base Camp, and it's named after Ed Hillary, who's a real hero. And uh, it is very interesting looking, and all the uh, handrails, the hand cables, have got like prayer flags and ribbons and scarves wrapped around them, and they blow in the wind and. It looks very spectacular. And This bridge is basically one step above the trope bridge that is made of wooden planks in which one wooden plank in the movie always breaks as the characters try to walk across it. Yeah. Uh, that, that is, this bridge is better than that in construction, but just barely. It's interesting. When you, when you, do, this, when you do that trek to, um, to Everest, I'm just looking. The first YouTube video that, ha- that comes up of the Hillary Suspension Bridge, I'm hoping it might actually be mine. It is mine. <laughs> oh, look at when, that. When you Google it, yeah, I, made a, I just made a little short video showing it. It's interesting. When you do this trek, you, you see, you go over, you know, it seems like hundreds of bridges like, like this. And they're usually made of like metal and things like that. And they feel, they feel pretty safe. You get used to them. But in almost all cases, about five or six meters below, sometimes collapsed, sometimes still intact, is that cliched wooden broken bridge. <laughs> that they used to really use and you look down at it and you think oh my goodness people used to actually go over that and it's usually rotting away and mm-hmm. uh looks terrible and you're going over the more sturdy one above but you do see mm-hmm. lots of cool bridges like that so uh, mm-hmm. yeah hillary suspension bridge uh you 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 look to the other side first and make sure there's no cows or or donkeys or anything coming because you don't want to be on the bridge at the same time as those guys they get right away <laughs> See, yeah, see, this, this is, again, the kind of situation I would not want to put myself in. I don't, I don't want to ever be at a bridge where I have to worry about livestock coming the other way. You would love it. You would love it afterwards. You would be so pleased you did it. If I hadn't died, yes, I would love it afterwards. That is true. 
But somebody's going to be the first person that the bridge breaks on. Yeah. Somebody's going to be that guy. Maybe. Yeah. What have you got? <laughs> it's a lottery ticket every time you cross. Give us your number two bridge. Uh, okay, so here's another one that I don't know if you're going to count this as a bridge or not. <laughs> have you got any that count as like normal bridges? I, g- I gave you one normal bridge. I gave you the Cologne Bridge. And my, the one that I'm saving it for the end, which I would say is my favorite bridge, right. uh, is a real bridge. Okay. So I have another one that I think it counts as a bridge, although you might not. Okay. And I would say that it is the Hoover Dam counts as a bridge. Ooh, okay. Now, have you ever been to the Hoover Dam? I never have because... The one, one of the, the one time I had a good chance to go there, they weren't letting buses go over it because it was too soon after 9-11 and I was on a bus. This is going to be a bit confusing for some people because at Hoover Dam, they have now finally built an actual bridge that goes over Hoover Dam. So the, the geography of this is a bit confusing, but when people think of Hoover Dam, they tend to think of something that's kind of level with the surrounding area, mm. but that's not really the case. Like Hoover Dam is already a fair bit down inside the gorge through which the river passes. Mm. So there is there is ground that is above it. And probably since the creation of Hoover Dam, they have desperately needed a through road for all the people who are driving by Hoover Dam but don't want to visit Hoover Dam, like the thousands of tourists who are clogging up the actual road <laughs> that goes across the dam. Yeah. And so it just actually, I think in the past five years or so, they have finished the construction of an actual bridge that does go over Hoover Dam. So that is not the bridge that I'm talking about because the first time I went to Hoover Dam, that bridge was not there. And the second time I went to Hoover Dam, that bridge was under construction. Oh, I can see pictures of it now, yeah. It's like away from the dam. It sort of ruins the the look a bit, doesn't it? In person, it's actually much more impressive than it looks in pictures. Right. At least when, when I saw it under construction, I thought, oh, this is kind of cool looking. Mm. But more importantly, it is desperately necessary because both times I have been to Hoover Dam, it's just a traffic nightmare. I cannot imagine anybody who has to drive across that for non-tourist reasons. They must lose their mind. <laughs> I think it counts as a bridge. Would you give me that as a bridge? Well, I don't think I have a choice. Aren't construction pictures of the Hoover Dam brilliant? They are. They are. And if, if anybody, if you visit the Hoover Dam, you know, you can go deep down into the bowels of the Hoover Dam. It is very, it is a very interesting place. And it has a kind of my, this architecture that I just love, which is the art deco, we are humans building amazing things kind of architecture. They have these very stylized, I forget what they call them, but they're the, they're the Hoover Dam angels. I'll put a picture of them in the show notes. But it is, it is this just art deco look that i love uh and so hoover dam is done in that style and i I really do quite like it all right that's borderline for a bridge but i'm gonna give it to you it counts as a bridge because i've got nothing else for you okay i for my number two we're getting into cliche territory here but that's just the way it is my number two i'm gonna go for the golden gate bridge yeah yeah what can you say it just is man it is what it is it's awesome you look at it and it's like a celebrity walked in the room because it is it's a celebrity bridge and like you know, whenever I see it, when you're flying into San Francisco and you see it for the first time against the water, you're that color of it and, and you, you know, you walk across it. It's just, it's a superstar. And, you know, and because San Francisco has become a bit of a second home at the moment with the number file stuff, you know, it also feels like I feel a bit of extra loyalty to it. But wherever I am or whatever I'm doing, if I can see it, I'll look at it. I love it. I, I believe... I may, I may have this entirely wrong, but I'm dredging up from my memory somewhere that the color of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge is not the color it was intended to be. Is I think not? that the what, is that I think a the, name is it not like International Orange or something or International Red or it's got some. Well, well, that's just it. The 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 name I, I think it's like a it's like a warning color paint. That's it's some it's some kind of standard. But my understanding is like this was supposed to just be during the construction phase that this was not intended to be the uh, the permanent color of the bridge. Oh. That may be entirely wrong, and maybe I'll cut it later if it is, or maybe I just won't if I'm feeling lazy. So I will leave it I to love stuff the listener. Like that. I love stories like that. I hope it's true. I'm gonna you're gonna send me down a Wikipedia rabbit hole now. Were you there when I made all the YouTubers all walk across the Golden Gate Bridge? Uh, I have walked across the Golden Gate Bridge with a bunch of YouTubers, but I'm not sure if you are talking about this particular. Is this at the last uh, YouTube EDU conference? Yeah, because everyone about? was like, no one knew what to do. And I just love walking across the Golden Gate Bridge. So I was like, let's all go and walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. So we all drove out there. And it was, yeah, you must have been there. And, you know, Vi and Destin and Hank Green and... Uh, 
I, I was there for that. I did not realize that the reason we were walking across the bridge was because of your yeah, insistence. Yeah, yeah. Because after uh, about halfway across, I kind of then felt the pressure because you know there wasn't great weather that day, and everyone was kind of like some people didn't seem that into it, and I kind of felt pressure that people weren't enjoying it because I'd suggested it. And then so I was like, oh, we can turn back if you want to. And other people were like, we're not turning back. And you're the one that said we should do it. So there became a bit of a, like, do we walk all the way across or not? But Yes, we, we, we were there on that day. I think I have a couple of pictures I really like of, of everybody who was at the EDU conference uh, on that day going across the bridge. And that was, uh, that was nice. It was fun memories of San Francisco. I will suggest one more thing. Because um, it's Christmas Day, like, don't, don't, don't actually do it now. But there's a really good documentary called The Bridge which is very macabre, very sad, uh, but completely <laughs> fascinating. And it's one of my favorite documentaries. Um, it's all about the Golden Gate Bridge and suicide and Merry Christmas. But, but seriously, <laughs> yes. like it is, it is a really good documentary <laughs> and really significant. And if you like filmmaking and documentaries and things, I can't, I really recommend it. Yeah. I guess if you found our conversation about terrorism too uplifting for your <laughs> Christmas afternoon, go ahead and watch that documentary. It is very good. Have you ever seen it? I have not ever seen you it. You should watch it. You should watch okay. it. I will. I'll put it on my list. <laughs> do it. Seriously, do it. I, think, I will. I will. I, I, I think you. you will. I think you will. Uh, I'm not saying you'll like it, but I think you'll take something from it. I will. I'll put it on my list. Yeah. Okay. Is it my turn or it's is it your, your turn? turn? It's your It's your number one, although I know they're not in order. My personal favorite bridge is the Golden Jubilee Bridges, which are here in London. And this, the naming is always slightly confusing because there are two bridges that are on, kind of on top of each other. One is called the Hungerford Bridge, which is a bridge that is just for trains that crosses the Thames at Embankment. Yeah. And right on either side of the Hungerford Bridge are these two additional footpath-only bridges that were built later. And those are called the Golden Jubilee Bridges, built yeah. for the Queen's Golden Jubilee. And I absolutely adore these bridges. For various reasons, I happen to be in that area a lot. And every time I walk across that bridge, it just makes me happy. It's in a beautiful spot in the city. Yeah, good views there. Yeah, you have tremendous views of everything. And that skyline in particular, I feel like I have walked across that bridge so many times. I have taken so many pictures from that bridge. <laughs> I have more often than I really should just tweeted pictures from that bridge. Uh, it's hard to resist because it always just makes me very happy. And I have seen that skyline now change over, I guess, the 10, 11, 12, 11. I have no idea. The more than a decade that I have been here in London, I have seen a whole bunch of buildings go up. And I love, I love seeing that kind of thing. And so for me, just just personally, that is my favorite bridge in the world at this moment. And every chance I get, I walk across it. If people come and visit me, I often start, if we're going to go for a walk, it's like, oh, hey, let's start an embankment. And then, oh, look, there's this bridge that we get to cross. Let's walk <laughs> across it and take a look at all the things. Um, so that is my my current favorite bridge. It's part bridge. of your kind of London brag tour, is it? Uh, yeah, or just a, just a nice way to see London. Yeah, um, so yeah it is, is nice. It's not, I mean, it's, it is an amazing part of the world just there, mm -hmm. like to you know, see Westminster and everything. And So you're going to top that? What's your, what's your bridge? Well, mine's probably pretty predictable, but, um, but I have to say it cause it just, it is just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's another superstar and it's the superstar for me. Mm -hmm. And that is the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Oh, of course, of course you're going to have to go with the home team. Well, I didn't see the Sydney Harbour Bridge till quite late in life for an Australian cause I didn't go to Sydney till I may, I may have been in my twenties. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, uh, and the first time I saw it with my own eyes, it was like that's it, and like you can glimpse it from different parts of the city, and then you get out on the water and you see it in all its glory. But no matter where you see it from, what angle, uh, whether it's you know side on or front on, and what it, you know you're catching a snippet of it between buildings and things like that, or the full the full panorama, it's brilliant from every angle, and I cannot stop looking at it. And even even now that I've probably seen it a million times. I just cannot tear my eyes away from it. If I'm if I'm anywhere that has a view of it, I have to look at it. <laughs> it's so much bigger than you think. It's really industrial and chunky and it manages to it manages to look really old from another era while at the same time looking really modern like an amazing piece of engineering. Hmm. I think it's got it's got everything going for it. It's in this incredible, beautiful location. It's right in the heart of the city, unlike the Golden Gate Bridge, which feels it like it's a bit you know, pushed away from 
the heart of San Francisco. It's sort of out in the outskirts. You know, Sydney Harbour Bridge is like this big beast in the middle, in the middle of everything, in the middle of the harbour. I've had some great, you know, a couple of lovely New Year's Eves right underneath it, watching fireworks, and I was there for the Olympics, and it's a great centerpiece for celebration. It's got, it's got everything. Sydney Harbour Bridge. Oh, yeah, it really is in the center. I'm just pulling it up on the maps here. And yeah, mm. it is right in the middle. It couldn't be any more in the yeah, middle, it looks brilliant. like, on the it's satellite. Brilliant. It's It's got everything. I have not done the bridge climb because lots of people are going to ask if I've done it. And oh, well, I was immediately going to ask because that was, not that I know anything about it, but when I type in Sydney Harbour Bridge, Google immediately says, yeah. Sydney Harbour Bridge climb, question mark. Yeah, I've and not, I want I to know not what that done is. that yet. I will do it one day, but... Um, what is it? You can you put on like harnesses and you harness and you clip onto a rope and you can sort of climb over the span over the arch and you know. Oh God, really? Yeah, yeah. Not something that sounds like you'd do. Uh, I, well, it sounds. I mean, you clipped in. Yeah, you clipped in. Yeah. It's, uh, that sounds better than like you know the 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 Mount Everest bridge, the Indiana where, Jones bridge. <laughs> yeah, I mean you're not clipped in on that one. So yeah. I guess if I had to choose between the two, it sounds like I would do something. I would do the Sydney Harbour Bridge climb before I would go across that Hillary yeah. Bridge. And I think the Hillary Bridge will collapse before the Sydney Harbour Bridge does as well. But yeah. yes, I would also I would also wager that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I did have some honourable mentions, but I'll save them for another day. I, oh I, yeah, no, great, great. So we can continue. Yeah, we can continue. That was all right. That was pretty good fun, wasn't it? I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it, and <laughs> it is Christmas. Thank you for humouring me. This is my Christmas gift to you, Brady. <laughs> is talking to you about bridges so it's time for our uh, middle earth corner <laughs> you first things first uh-huh. you released a very popular new video in the last few days as we record all about lord of the rings sort of mythology i have to say uh-huh. it is surely the geekiest nerdiest video of yours that i can remember watching uh really do you think so yeah Uh, like in terms of uh, here's here's the mythology of something that's already (laughs) fiction so here's the fiction within the fiction and it's like all really like you know (laughs) i did love it you know i learned i learned from it and i enjoyed it and so have many many other people that's your nerd uh, voice there i like that (laughs) yeah but it was a bit it was a bit like here's a made-up thing and now here's the made-up thing within the made-up thing (laughs) And it's like the sort of thing that a nerd would take really seriously. Oh, no, well, technically, technically, they're the angels, brothers of the sisters of the thing. And the... Your nerd voice is making me really uncomfortable, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's hitting a little too close to home is, is maybe what that is. <laughs> hey, no one's a bigger nerd than me, so uh, take it as a compliment. But but well done on the video. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess in that case, you're right. It, is, it, it may be the nerdiest thing I've done because it is about a fictional universe. So yeah, I, I was originally a bit like, oh, what does he mean it's nerdy? But then your nerd voice. I think you've just convinced me. Yeah. You're obviously uh, cashing in on uh, the Hobbit movie, you opportunist you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's more like this finally got my, my butt in gear on a project I've been working on for a long time. Mm. I think in particular, uh, Henry, he of Minute Physics, has probably sick of hearing me mention this project because I've mentioned it to him a couple times mm. over the past little while that I was working on this thing. I think he was getting to feel a bit like, uh-huh, yeah, now I've been hearing about this Lord of the Rings project for a long time now and seeing a whole bunch of nothing. Uh, I was going through my old emails about this project because there were a couple of people that I wanted to put in the special thanks at the end of the video, one of which is Professor Verilin, who is a Tolkien professor who has a, a website where she talks about this stuff. And I realized that I first sent her an email two years ago now Hmm. where I had compiled my initial notes for the very first draft of this video and I sent them to her and she she gave me the thumbs up said that I I had it right and that I I was trying to work on this video you don't necessarily I'm not I haven't obviously been working on this for two years but it's I have many projects like this where they have been started and stopped and they have to be paused and then and then re-brought back a few times. So this is a project that has been in an, in existence in some form or another for two years, but has been activated and then shelved a bunch of times, which is also why I think Henry has heard about it from me several times. Sorry, I'm just curious before uh, before I ask you about yep. your own thoughts on it. What did the professor think of the finished product? Has she watched your final video and told you what she thought of it? So I actually I haven't heard back from her. The other person that I asked was uh, uh, someone who works at askmiddleearth.tumblr.com, which is <laughs> uh, uh, a, a very nice, like, bite-sized 
website for frequently asked questions about Middle Earth stuff, which people might want to check out. I know that that he he was looking at the the final draft of my video and or sorry, he was looking at the final draft of my script and said that there were there weren't any errors. And I he saw I saw that he uh, posted on his Tumblr and he liked it, so that was good. Are you pleased with it? Any anything we should know about behind the scenes? One of the things that had been holding up this project for a very long time was I had done a bunch of initial drafts with stick figures. And unlike many of my other videos, this has a lot of characters and kind of particular individuals. Hmm. And with my with my very limited art abilities, I was never able to find a satisfactory way to distinguish between all of the different groups of people and all of the different individuals. Yeah. And so the artwork was really something that was that was holding this project back for a long time. And then since I started working with Knut, it was one of the very first things I started to think of was like, hey, maybe I could have this guy help me out with the Lord of the Rings. And yeah. luckily, I didn't drive him away with all of my crazy insistence on the facial expression of Queen Lion in the last one. And so uh, he signed up for another round of lots of picky, picky uh, <laughs> changes from me. And, and we worked together on a bunch of different stuff. And I think it came out really great. You know, he sent me a bunch of different concepts for how the artwork could be. And we kind of narrowed it down to to the way it looks in the end. And I'm really thrilled with it. I could never have done this. So just as a huge thanks, huge thanks goes to him with helping me out on this video. So that's, um, that's, that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. Well done, Canute. Yeah, it looks it looks just great. I absolutely and what's this about it. IPA? What's going on here? Oh, okay. Yeah. So some people saw me complaining on Twitter. So mm. anybody who is a kind of Lord of the Rings fan knows Tolkien was a big fan of names. And so all this background stuff for Lord of the Rings is a little difficult to get into because not only are there a huge number of characters, but also Tolkien gives all of them four or five names. There's elven names, there's their actual names in their own languages, there's human translations for the names, there's just a million names. And there's this phenomenon when you read stuff that you just don't have any idea how it's supposed to be pronounced. And so here was the problem that I ran into. I'm familiar with lots of these names and I'm reading them and I have an idea of in my head how they are pronounced. But of course, with things that you read and you never hear another person speak out loud because there are not many times in life when you run across someone else who wants to talk out loud with you about the mythology behind the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> you don't have a chance to compare pronunciation notes. And so I don't know how this kind of slipped my mind, but I did not realize until the morning I was, I had to record it. This was the day that, that uh, the final Hobbit movie was released in the States. And I was frantic in the morning, like, okay, I have everything all set. I just need to record the audio for this. And I realized I don't have any idea how to pronounce some of these names <laughs> for real. I know in my head how I pronounce them, yeah. but I have no idea if I'm going to do this right. And Let's just put it this way. The kinds of people who get into the Tolkien mythology, they are nerdy, detail-oriented people. Yeah. And so I was suddenly terrified that I was going to get all of these wrong. But I had to, I had to do something really quick. And so on a lot of guidelines, they have the um, IPA listing for how the name should be pronounced. IPA meaning what? Okay. So anybody who's gone to Wikipedia articles at the top... If you look at some article, it'll say like, oh, here, here is the word. And then they have a bunch of little symbols, which are like funny shaped letters. So it's like the upside down or the backwards E or the bold I. It's like this string of little characters. And I'm sure almost everybody's had this experience where you think, oh, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this word. And you click on those strange characters. And then on Wikipedia, it takes you to this page that shows you how each of these letters is supposed to be pronounced. So they'll say like, oh, you know, uh, if you see a bold C, it's supposed to be C as in cat, not C as in scent, right? Yeah. So that, that sounds relatively easy. But where it gets really hard is with the vowel sounds yeah. of how do you represent what the different vowel sounds are supposed to be. So I found myself infuriated the morning that I was supposed to be recording the audio, trying to work through some of the IPA stuff. And it just brought to head a lot of problems that I have with the IPA. I think it is just totally useless. I don't think there is anybody who's not a professional linguist that this stuff actually helps with because you, you, you're, you're looking at a word that you don't know how to pronounce. And then you have to look at a bunch of symbols that most people are just not familiar with. So in, in your mind, you don't have placeholders for these things. You have to think, oh, I am looking for the, the, the funnily written H or this bizarre symbol over here, this little line. Then you have to find it on a list 
And then on that list, it shows you a bunch of other words to try to compare that sound to. And so if you were trying to do something long, like what I was trying to do, Eru Iluvatar, right? This is a name that I wanted to check. You, you cannot, if you are not already familiar with it, successfully use the IPA to tell you how to pronounce this because there's just too many things that you're mentally juggling in your head. And then the, like too many of the vowel things are just are not clear enough. And so I just, I hate the IPA. And it feels like this relic from a bygone era when people had to write dictionaries and there was, there was no way of conveying audio information to other people. And I was just infuriated. Why is there not a website where I can copy and paste the IPA symbols, and a computer just spits out the sounds for me. Th this doesn't exist. There's a couple things that were sort of close, but just terrible when I t tested them against actual words that I know how to pronounce. It just came out all wrong. It's like, look, look, IPA people, if you think this system is co as consistent as you think it is, I should be able to take these symbols and have a computer spit out the sounds. But it doesn't seem like this is possible. No. And I was complaining on Twitter. And then... What irritates me is people who are professional linguists writing back and they're going, oh, the IPA is incredibly useful. And I am sure if you use this every day that it is a tool that can convey meaning to professionals. But I just think it is, it is totally useless for people who don't use it all the time. I've never been able to use this to successfully figure out how to pronounce a word that I don't already know how to pronounce. Now, I will admit that my particular problem is what they call a corner case. It does not affect very many people because... How often is someone ever trying to find out the pronunciation of a word that doesn't either exist in their own language or an actual language spoken by other humans? I imagine not very often, but this is what I'm trying to do if I'm looking up something like Istari, which is an elven word. There are surprisingly like few cases, I think, where someone is ever going to be using the IPA to try to figure out made-up words. So, also, though, like all of this aside, yeah. And I, you know, I, I was going to say I feel your pain, but I'd be lying. Yeah, I know but, you'd be lying. But <laughs> all of this aside, uh -huh. who's the official arbiter of the pronunciation of these words anyway? Because the guy who made them up, made them up, I should say, is dead. And like, so who do we go to to find out how is starry or whatever that word like, like? Isn't it just some arbitrary decision anyway how to pronounce it? Okay, so Tolkien did have pronunciation guides. Um, yeah, he he right, so he wrote down. Well, why why aren't you using those? It was it's it's complicated. Well, well his, his guides are, are are tricky, but there are also um, there are recordings of him actually speaking out loud the names of lots of this stuff. Okay. Like there's, there's lots of audio recordings of him. But this is the thing: if if I wasn't time constrained, this would not be such an issue. But I had to get this done on the day the movie was being released, I figured. And so, like, the clock was ticking, and I did not have time to go chase down a whole bunch of stuff to try to find every Tolkien recording ever. Anyway, that ended up just being a, a frustrating, irritating morning. Um, but I also just find, like, if, if people were sending me, like, lists of the IPA stuff, and the other problem with this is I find that the, the things are confusing because, well... It's almost like when you get if you if you think about a dictionary too long, the whole thing just seems insane because you're using words to define words, and you can end up getting into these bizarre loops, mm -hmm. right? Where you're like, oh, we're going to use words to define themselves. Like, oh God, how does this start somewhere? And you go, it doesn't start anywhere, right? They're all just interconnected, and the IPA does the same thing with with human sounds. They're always writing, oh, it's it's like the the sounds in this word. Well, how do you know how I pronounce this word? And they try to give you a whole bunch, but I just think it's so easy to fall off the path here. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I just feel like we're in a world now where we can have recordings of stuff. Let's just use those. We don't we don't need to have this this strange system that has such prominence at the top of every Wikipedia article. Just have a just have a button I can click where the word is pronounced. Don't show me the IPA stuff. It's it's totally unhelpful to almost absolutely everybody. Is is my my problem with the IPA stuff. All right. Anyway, sorry about that. How did you go in the end? Did did many people leave comments saying that you got pronunciations wrong, or did has, has it been pretty positive that you uh, you nailed most of them? I'm pretty pleased. I nailed most of them. I got one slightly wrong, um, but it's it was it was okay. Uh, what one was that? Okay, so uh, I got I got wrong uh, Yavana, which I think in the video I I reversed the V and the N sounds. I think I said uh, Yanava, or I can't I can't quite remember which way I said it, but uh, 
Yovana, I, th- I might be saying it wrong right now. I, I suddenly can't remember. No, now, now that that ruined the video for me. Yeah, well, there's, you know, there's always there's always something. There was a typo in the video. It's like there are always typos. I can never avoid that. But but all things considered, I was I was very worried about this video because I thought this was a this was a real exercise in leaving out information. Um, I love the Lord of the Rings stuff, and you can go really deep on Lord of the Rings <laughs> and the background information and. I find that it is a world that it has this perfect mixture of consistency, but also mystery. I find like that is a very difficult balance to get right. But I think the Tolkien universe just just hits that really perfectly. Um, but when I was say I, I said in the beginning of the video, millions of, of pages. It's obviously hyperbole, and nerds were correcting me. They go, "Well, actually, the Cimmerillion only has four hundred pages." But it's like, <laughs> so you can do nerd voice too. <laughs> yes, but. But it's like, yes, I just showed a picture of the Cimmerillion because if any people might be vaguely familiar with this book, but it's like there's the legendarium, there's the Tolkien letters, there's there's all of Christopher Tolkien's writings. There's just there are thousands and thousands of pages of stuff talking about everything that has ever happened. And I was I was worried millions. But anyway, so I, I, I was worried. I was worried that. I had to dramatically simplify a whole bunch of this stuff. And so I thought, ooh, I might have just made a video that is too uninteresting for most people, but actually irritates the hell out of the people who would like it the most as as Tolkien fanatics, because I had to simplify a whole bunch of stuff. And it just strikes me as a video that did not need to be made. And that's what <laughs> that's what I love about it. <laughs> like there's no like it's not like I was sitting there thinking, do you know what? I just you know, Hobbit and Lord of the Rings is okay, but I just want to know what they believe behind all that. Like, you know, it's like it didn't need, but that's that. They're the most fun things, isn't it? Like yeah, doing, yeah. Like doing lists of bridges. Yeah. I don't and think anyone would have tuned in today thinking, "I hope they do a list of bridges," because there's absolutely no reason for that. Yeah, well, I was making fun of you before for things that you're interested in, but of course, this is my version of of the bridge. <laughs> I'm in, <laughs> like, I'm intensely interested in this stuff, and I totally love it, but it is. It is not useful in any way. And and this is, again, just going to the, the arbitrariness of human interest. I cannot say why I'm so interested in it, really. Uh, I can try to come up with reasons. But, you know, ultimately, you are interested in stuff or you aren't interested in stuff. But for the record, Tolkien nerds, I just want to I just want to get something on the record here. I am perfectly aware of the great contention over the origin of orcs. I just had to go with one version of the story and I went with what I think is the simplest one for people who are unfamiliar with the Cimmerillion and all of the other writings. But please, no more emails about the actual relationship between Melkor and the creation of life. I am fully aware of this. I just, this was an exercise in simplification. So there, I just wanted to want to get that on record. But, but you forgot to mention <laughs> that. I'll tell you what. What? You were complaining about your, um, your easy bridge homework. Yeah. You sent me into Bristol on one of the busiest shopping days of the year to uh-huh. fight the crowds uh-huh. to go and see the Hobbit movie today so that we could talk about it. Did, so, uh, so I did my homework. <laughs> did, I, did I send you in? I, I think I suggested that this would be something that we might want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure this was homework homework in the same way that you you commanded that I come up with five bridges and told me nothing about it. Um <laughs> No, we have we have uh, related to Lord of the Rings stuff. We have both just watched the um, final Hobbit movie. We sort of did it at the same time as well, yes. didn't we? Yeah, we were our, our we weren't in the same location, but our our uh, movie watching experience was overlapped today yeah. to watch the Hobbit: The Battle of the Five Armies. So we're going to talk about it now, are we? Um, I, you know, we can talk about it now. I, I took some notes. I assume you took some notes as well. Do you know what? I was really experience. nerdy and I took notes during the film on my iPhone. Like I'm I was, really impressed. Yeah, I am and, genuinely and surprised. I did it on a um, like on an on an email, like on an open email, uh-huh. and then I don't think I saved it to drafts because I can't oh. find them, so I haven't actually got them. <laughs> oh. So I wrote like seven or eight really interesting notes and. Um, that's just, you know, but you know what, you know I've what, Brady? Them. I'm going to give you credit for trying. I, I just assumed yeah. that you would take no notes at all. 
But I am quite pleased that you actually you you at least you at least attempted to take notes. Oh, it gets worse. I'll tell you a funny story about the end of the film afterwards as well. But let's talk about the film. Uh, okay. And I'll have one last check that these notes aren't here, but I'm pretty sure they're not. No, okay. they're gone. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, sorry, but I did take notes. <laughs> I, I I I do I do believe you. Where do we where do we start talking about this film? We both we both obviously had seen the first two, and I yes. think we've both spoken in non-glowing terms about the first two previously yes yes we have uh but but i I am going to start this with before actually watching the movie Hmm. when i purchased tickets Hmm. because i hate going to the movies i really hate everything about the movies yeah uh every once in a while i go to a movie for various reasons and it is not an enjoyable experience see i'm the opposite i love it (sighs) really it's like it's like the I don't do it much anymore. The last year or two, I've really dialed down because mm-hmm. for various reasons. And but it's like a real it's a real special occasion for me going to the movies. I really like it. Today was one of the first times it didn't feel like that. It felt mm-hmm. like a chore today. Well, because it was a chore. Yeah. But um, <laughs> That's why, why do you why that. do you hate it? Just because it involves like factors you can't control. Yeah, everything's out of my control. I can't mm-hmm. stop the movie. I can't pause it. I can't murder anybody in the theater who is being irritating <laughs> what whereas you can do that at home <laughs> <laughs> at home i can control the environment yeah um but at I, home I just, you haven't got a ginormous screen I, I i am perfectly willing to pass up the ginormous screen for control without without any hesitation that is a that is a trade i'm willing to make okay um so i i, I dislike everything about the movie going experience and so when I was suggesting, oh, this might be a thing to do for our Christmas show, I thought, okay, well, let me. now I have to go look. We agreed. I'm going to go buy tickets. And when I was looking, I was trying to find tickets for Lord of the Rings. And I discovered fortuitously that one of the theaters nearby me hmm. has what I'm going to refer to as the airport lounge version of watching a movie. Yeah, there's a few nice ones like that. Around. Yes. Yeah, I am very familiar with this experience and have indulged in it many yeah. times now. I I was completely unaware of this mm. ever, and this is the first I came across this. But basically, for five pounds more on the ticket, which considering the ticket, I think would have been fifteen pounds anyway, mm. um, you can get these big recliner seats. Yeah. You can have like a waiter who comes over and brings you popcorn when you press a button. Yeah, you, the, your screen is much smaller, but you're in a much smaller space. Yeah, and because it's more expensive, that acts as a child filter. People yeah. with lots of children don't want to go into the more expensive area. And I thought, man, this is just like when I was going to be stuck in, in Dulles Airport for many hours of uncomfortableness. I was going into this movie expecting many hours of uncomfortableness. And so I thought, this is exactly the moment I am happy to pay a little bit more to yeah. make this experience as comfortable as possible. Yeah, And so... I went into the the kind of lounge area to watch a movie and it mitigated a very large number of my complaints about movies, all of which center mostly around other people. Yeah. Um, so no, I have to say... Are. It's a great was, innovation. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting to discover and I, I, I still don't like movies, but having discovered the lounge, I would be more amenable to going to movies in the future. So that was 100% worth it. Do you know something I found interesting? What? And it gave me a little insight into maybe, you know, the life of the film critic and people like that. Because mm-hmm. this was one of the first times I could remember going to a film, like for work reasons, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. knowing that I was going to have to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And it's inevitable you start thinking about what you're thinking and what you might say in the podcast and things like that. And it really affects the way you watch the film, but also it starts... Then you start thinking, and then I started thinking about the fact that it was affecting my thinking, and then I could talk right. about that on the podcast, and it right. just kept going down all these layers like Inception, and like I started like, and then I could talk about the fact that I was talking about the fact that I was talking about the fact that I was talking about it, and it kind of yes. got, it kind of did my head in a bit, and the film hadn't even started. Yes, yes, it's, it's a different experience. I kept thinking about, uh, a while ago I read a, an article talking about Roger Ebert's work routine for reviewing movies. And uh, it just, it was interesting. He it would talk about, he always did things on, on handwritten notepads and 
just made no attempt to organize stuff while he was watching the movie. And so at the at the end of his movie experience, there would be a whole bunch of sheets just laying around him that he'd just torn off the pad as he kept writing stuff. <laughs> and, you know, presumably his poor secretary later had to try to put it all in order uh, and, and collect things together. But yes, I, I, I was aware of that immediately as well. The, the watching a movie, knowing that you're going to talk about it, is a is a slightly different experience mm. than just watching a movie regularly. Um, Did you have like expectations? I have to admit, there was a chance I probably would not have seen this film at the cinema. <laughs> I've been so burned by the previous two. I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm. Let, let me just put my cards on the table. Yeah, I've not read any books. Really, I've read none of them. Really, I am not. I am not the fan you are in any way. So you haven't you haven't read any of the mythology either, then I'm guessing. <laughs> no, oh yeah, I've read all, I've read those thousands of pages, but I yeah. thought the, the book was just not in depth enough for me. No, yeah. no, it was no. So I, I can't have a discussion with you about the differences between the three ages. You know, that's not we're not going to have that conversation. That, well, you can have it. It just it just won't be as uh, <laughs> it won't be on the level you might appreciate. No, so okay. I. I really enjoyed the three Lord of the Rings films. I think mm. they're masterpieces. Mm. Uh, I think they, they're not without flaws and they yep. occasionally got a bit tedious. But uh, overall, I really like them. I still re-watch them sometimes on a, on a winter's day. I'll sit down and watch one or two of them, you know, mm -hmm. director's cut length. I think they're great. Uh, and then I thought the first two Hobbit films were real disappointments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've discussed it before. And yes. To the point where I did not have high hopes attached to this one. Yes. So there's my there's my there's my starting point for today. Yeah. Let, let, let me let me let me do a similar thing. Mm -hmm. People may not be aware. I'm a fan of the Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but I, I I too I love the original Lord of the Rings movies, and I have watched all of the extended editions. I used to have the DVD box set with all of the background, like dozens and dozens of hours of the making of those movies i consumed all of that I, I just loved it and more importantly i think that those original three movies are a a masterful example of how to take books and film them because you you just you cannot just be completely faithful to a book when you make a movie these are fundamentally different mediums and I just think I have never seen a better book to book to movie transition than those Lord of the Rings movies. So I, I can enjoy both of them. I really like them. Obviously, I did not like the Hobbit movies. They are like a perfect example of how not to do a book to movie transition. They're Isn't just that terrible. Funny? And it's the same. It's the same, same team. Amazing. I, I was even staying through the credits again of this one, and I was looking, and I was like, "Yep, there's uh, Philippa, one of the main writers from the last one, who I've seen a million interviews with on the the extras, yeah. who seemed really competent then, and you know, and she's working with Peter Jackson, and and it's like I know all of like I know these movies well enough to recognize all of the writers and the producers, and like I've seen interviews with these people, and it's, it's just mind boggling to me that it's all the same team. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I didn't like the first two Hobbit movies, right. and so I was going into this one with ex with exactly exactly zero expectations whatsoever not even low expectations just nothing all right. um so there there is my starting point so did you like the movie how did you, how did you think what do you think of it you good thumbs up thumbs down thumbs down yeah thumbs down tedious yeah uh thankfully it didn't seem too long like it, it didn't <laughs> seem as long as the other ones I didn't dislike it. I was just completely, bleh. it was just like I was completely not engaged with it at all. Uh, couldn't, it was just repetitive, uh, boring. Uh, mm -hmm. Not like, not like, it didn't make me angry. Like it did, I wasn't thinking this is really bad. Like in the first one when that singing, dancing thing was going on in the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the, uh, Hobbit house. I was like, is yeah. this thing like a joke? This is terrible. It was never like that. It was <laughs> never like, or it wasn't like watching a Twilight movie where you think this is the worst thing that has ever been committed to celluloid or virtual celluloid. Yeah. It wasn't like that. It, was, it didn't offend me. It just, it just, <laughs> I just think it just completely failed to engage me in, it didn't, I didn't care. I didn't excite me. And I wasn't Im impressed by the filmmaking like I was in Lord of the Rings. Just it, all the things that the Lord of the Rings did well, mm -hmm. um, this failed. And the one, my one complaint about the Lord of the Rings films is that the battle scenes are a bit drag on a bit and are a bit too much. Mm -hmm. And this film was just like one epic one of those battle scenes. <sighs> yeah. Um, so it, in an, another funny coincidence, I had been rereading The Hobbit 
And I actually just finished reading The Hobbit this morning um, before going then to see the final movie. And to be clear, I, I am not complaining about differences that are from the book. You have to do things differently. But the Battle of the Five Armies in the book The Hobbit, the entirety of it is maybe, maybe two and a half pages. No. It, it is the briefest thing that happens. And I always think Tolkien, spoilers for The Hobbit people, uh, <laughs> Tolkien pulls this great move where he clearly doesn't like to write about battles. Like oh. in, the, in the actual books, there are not many battles described in great detail. And so in The Hobbit, he, he describes the kind of setup. Here are the armies. Here's where the orcs are. They're advancing this way. Humans are on one side of the mountain. Um, elves on the other side. And the, 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 um, the eagles come in. But then Bilbo gets knocked out, gets knocked unconscious. And this allows Tolkien, the author, to just skip the whole battle. Mm. Right? You turn the page and Bilbo wakes up when the battle is over. And somebody then just quickly relays to him what happened. Um, so the actual battle is like nothing at all. And then this movie is four hours of a battle, which, again, could be done well because a, a movie is a visual medium. Yeah. And I think that the last time I remember being blown away by special effects in a movie theater was the final Lord of the Rings movie and the final battle in that movie. It that was, was the last time I remember was, really feeling like. It was a like, bit much, but it was pretty good. Yeah. It was like, I'm not saying it was a great battle scene and watching it later in life, I have found it a little bit long. Um, mm. But at the time when I saw it, that was like the last time I was really blown away by special effects. Because I, because I watched this, I was watching this battle today, right? Yeah. This endless, endless battle. <laughs> endless. <laughs> and I know I was imagining, is he doing this because he is being loyal to the book? And then if, if he was, which I now know he wasn't, but if he was, I was trying to imagine how the book wrote this and basically it would this is how the book would read it would be you know gmoch the hoch from the north of the hoch um took his broadsword and he swiped a guy to his left and killed him and he swiped a guy to his right and then he swiped another guy to his left and then he fell over and then some giant beast was just about to kill him and just before the big beast killed him, some <laughs> hero gmoch, gmoch from the west suddenly appeared and shot him with an arrow. Mm -hmm. Phew, that was really close. Yeah. Repeat this 19 times. <laughs> and, then, and then a great horn sounded and everyone looked to their right. And yet another army that you don't care about and know nothing about <laughs> suddenly appeared on the crest of the mountain and came running down the mountain. And Gmoch the Hoch from the south swiped one to the left and swiped one to the right, and then he fell over and he was just about to die again, and you were sure he was going to die this time. <laughs> and at the last possible moment, Cindy the wizard from the east jumped in and, and <laughs> saved the day. Repeat that 19 times. And then another horn sounds and another army appears. And it's like, for goodness sake, I don't even know who these armies are. I don't know who these characters are. I don't know who I am supposed to support. The people who I thought were the good guys are suddenly gone a bit evil. Is the is the ring a big deal? I, I know the ring is famous, but now all they care about is some stone. And these other guys are after some necklace. And another guy <laughs> wants the gold. And then there's some other battle going off somewhere else and some people are going on a mission somewhere else and I don't know who they are and what they're looking for. I don't know who I I don't know who I want to win. The only person I care about is the Hobbit because right. Martin Freeman's a pretty good actor and he was an excellent choice for Bilbo. Yeah, I have to he's say. he's good. So you know, I hope he lives. Uh, <laughs> and I know he lives. So there's no there's no tension there because the one person I care about I know is gonna live. And it's like goodness me. Like <laughs> That's why I would, but also, I didn't like the way the film was made as much. Like the first three films, Peter Jackson felt like this kind of Cecil B. DeMille guy to me. It's like he had gone back to old school filmmaking and it felt like he was building big things and there were lots of people there and he was making this epic film. And he used lots of effects very well, but it felt like a lot of it was real as well. And this one felt a lot more a lot more effects driven. Yeah. Uh, it felt like, you know, he's been drinking the George Lucas aid. Yeah. And yeah. like, 
it's like, oh, you know, go back to, I know it's more expensive maybe, but one of the nice things about Lord of the Rings was it felt dirty. It felt like they had dirt on their hands and there were real rocks and swords and this felt a lot faker in every way. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny you mentioned that because I, I had the same the same feeling, which again is like the Star Wars original prequels versus the later ones, mm. where I was I was really aware in lots of the big army scenes that it just looked so CGI, which mm. is really interesting because of course the original movie used tons of CGI to fill in fill in these characters, but they did a much better job of mixing actual live action with overhead CGI shots to make it feel much more real. And here is like, oh, wow, let me watch these two computer armies fight each other. It is, it is no no interest whatsoever. But your description of the beginning of the movie, right? So, so here's the story of my notes. I go into this movie and I, I have no expectations. And I felt for, I, I'm, I'm going to say for the first half of the movie, I felt like I was sitting there and I just had no reaction whatsoever to anything. Mm. Like, I, like I was this empty vessel through which light and sound was passing. Yeah. And I was just, I was connected to absolutely nothing. And so I have almost no notes from the beginning of it, <laughs> except I noticed a couple of things which I thought were interesting that like, one, this movie made no attempt to help anybody who just showed up at this point. It's yeah. like they, they know who they're selling these tickets to. It's people who've watched the first two. Yeah. You know, good luck to you if you don't know who these people are. The first half of it, I had just no reaction whatsoever. And I was thinking, I can give this movie a kind of meh, like it made yeah. no impression on me whatsoever. Yeah. But then, but then about halfway through, suddenly my notes start. <laughs> and my notes start with this, this line that Gandalf says about how the orcs have this whole other second army they've been holding back that are about to arrive. Yeah. And my note says, a second front approaches? Question mark. Oh no, I thought the movie was over. Yeah. And and this was exactly my feeling of like the movie suddenly turned for me where I felt like it was wrapping up and I had already felt like I had been sitting there for a long time and I just had no reaction. And then there is there was just as much to continue sitting through with this second front of orcs that approach. And like that was supposed to be, I imagine it, like that was supposed to be like a dramatic twist, was it? Was it supposed? Were we supposed to go, oh no? But I was so disengaged. It maybe I was the same. It was just like, oh okay, another battle. Yeah, it was. Like, it another. was. It was just. I cannot believe that this is this is going to continue onward. And yeah, yeah they, they could have ended the movie right there, and it would have made no difference to anything whatsoever. And then the other thing, which you picked up on, you mentioned it, and I and I had this little this little comment in my notes, which was. I cannot believe that they did something, which was they had not not once, not twice, but thrice, they had the same shot of hero on the ground, big troll creature over the hero, dramatically lifts hammer slash sword over mm -hmm. its head to smash the hero on the ground. And at the last second, somebody off camera jumps on the orc oh, yeah. or shoots it, right? You just expect it now. It's no, just but, like, yeah, there's okay. no drama because you know but, it's going to happen. Some okay, hero is okay. going to appear. I have to tell you, though. Here, here was the thing. So they do it once. Okay. You get one of these in a movie. That's fine. Yeah. Right? It's, you know. Okay. They did it a second time. And I thought, did they forget that they already did this <laughs> shot in the movie? <laughs> right? Did they did they forget like this is the second troll that I've seen doing this exact same thing where someone stops at the last moment? Now here's the thing. The third time, spoilers obviously people. The third time, it's Thorn Oakenshield on the ground who I know perfectly well from the books is going to die. And I had a brief moment where I thought, I think Peter Jackson has just done something brilliant here. We have seen twice the hero come from off screen to save our main character. Mm but I know Thorin is going to die. And they're setting us up in this third shot. And I thought, man, this is going to be a hell of a movie moment if this character with his gigantic hammer just smashes Thorin Oakenshield dead, mm. right? Because they've trained us to expect someone to jump in and it's mm. going to be really shocking when they don't. Mm. Nope, nope, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> they just use the exact same shot three times times yes and, and the thing that killed me was they slowed down time each time it's like how can you watch this movie and not keep track of this and, mm. oh that, I, I found that just like for a brief moment i really did think this is going to even if the rest of the movie is terrible this is an amazing setup that is going to work great 
nope, opportunity missed. We're going to just have a hero save him again. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we've, we've talked about this a little bit offline as well, but this movie is again, an example of action scenes that just don't engage you like action scenes yeah. that have no sense of danger. Um, there was, there was one part I made, I made a note, uh, about as well. So this is like, again, hundreds of, of orcs and dwarves and elves and everybody's fighting and just goes on and on forever. But there is a shot where there's another wave of orcs that have just arrived and they kind of catch Bilbo off guard. Um, yeah. And he bends down and picks up a handful of, of rocks. Now, Bilbo is a tiny halfling. These orcs are, are gigantic and tough creatures that are wearing armor. Yeah. Bilbo one shots five of these yeah. orcs yeah. with stones that he's throwing from his hands. Yeah. And, and this to me is the, exactly the kind of thing like, don't filmmakers understand? There's no sense of danger here. Yeah. Are, these, are these creatures dangerous? Or can a tiny pebble thrown by what is basically a child completely kill or knock out five of them just immediately yeah because and we're told these are like these guys are bred for fighting like yeah and but then like you know you run into the front and every and always the lead guy the leader of the army who runs into one of these fronts and i lost i lost count of the number of times some some hero leads the charge into a huge wall of yeah. villains they always go in with their sword and take down 15 or 20 of them before anyone knows what's going on like does, do the guys on the front of these fronts, like, do they ever land a punch or a sword or a, yeah. like, it's just, it's like, yeah, it's like stormtroopers, isn't it? Always missing and stuff, I know, but it's just like. But there, but there's a there's a difference here where you can establish this reasonably well. And I think that the, the original Lord of the Rings does a much better job with this, where, again, spoilers, there's going to be spoilers forever. I'm just going to stop saying it. Mm-hmm. But. In the original Lord of the Rings, they kind of draw a, a better distinction between goblins, which are really small and numerous, but they also kind of give you the, the impression that the goblins are maybe not the best at fighting. Like cannon fodder. Yeah. And so you can have just tons of them and mm-hmm. you can much more easily accept that the goblins' advantage is in their numbers. Yeah. Right? But then you have the uruk which are built up as these are the ultra super soldiers. Mm. And in the first movie, the uruk kill one of the major characters. That's how you establish that there's actual there's an actual threat here. Yeah. There is something to be lost. And when the uruk show up, it is always actually bad news. And then the orcs are kind of somewhere in the middle. But yeah, this, this movie, it's like, oh, are they really tough or are they not really tough? It's just when you need th- thousands of them to die, they just die. Um, when you need them to be scary, they're suddenly scary. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that movie. You have to establish what the what the boundaries are. But I really did. I, I felt bad because I, I laughed out loud in the theater when when Bilbo is just like pow 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 one shotting these guys. Yeah. Uh, and they just they just fall over from a pebble that hits them against their clearly armored head. The other scene that was really jokey like that in video gamey was when that guy jumped in the trolley to save his kids and rolled down the. Oh yeah. yeah but anyway, yeah, that's yeah, just that, that was but, barred. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was Bard saving his family. I, I did really laugh out loud. The, the, thinking of Bard, there was a, a tremendously cheesy scene where the kind of weaselly, the weaselly guy asks asks the main character, Bard, you know, oh, why, why are you fighting for this fight? And the camera just rotates so that his family comes right in view. Yeah. And like Bard doesn't even like say anything. Yeah. And, and it's just like, oh, is, is the weaselly guy supposed to know the camera move that just <laughs> occurred here? And it's like, oh, well, I guess I'm doing it for my family. Yeah. But yeah, it's just it's just funny because, again, like the first half of the movie just left no impression. And then I suddenly have a thousand notes about things that I could not stand uh, in the second half because it was like it just crossed my threshold of too long, suddenly uninteresting. It didn't suddenly feel as long I as the no... others. Like it didn't, I don't know how long it was, but it didn't, it was too long, but it didn't. I, I will, I will agree. I, I don't know off the, off the top of my head the running time, but I'm willing to bet that this was shorter than the others. It yeah. did feel, it did feel shorter, but still, uh, still just way, way over the top. And I, oh, did, oh, I sorry, didn't go ahead. hate, I didn't, ha- I didn't like, but I didn't hate the opening sequence with the dragon. And I'm glad they kind of dis- dispensed, it, it was still too much, but they dispensed of it reasonably quickly. And I did like that. And it made me like that guy who killed the dragon. It made me yes. like him. And he became my second favorite character. 
So yes. that was there yes. was some merit to that opening sequence before the opening title comes on the screen. That was yes. that was all right. And this is this is a, a particular little moment here as well. This is another example of movies have to be different from books. Hmm. And so, in the book, that character Bard, hmm. it, it's going to sound almost unreasonable when I say this. You've been reading this whole book about the hobbits and the dragon, and the dragon flies off to go attack Lake Town. Hmm. Tolkien then introduces the character of Bard. Has Bard killed the dragon, ends the chapter without ever mentioning him again, in the space of maybe three pages. That's the kind of thing you cannot possibly do in a movie. You can't be like, oh, the dragon flies off, and this dude you've never heard of just kills him. Oh, and then we're never going to mention him again. Right. You, you have to change things in a movie. And you, you can get away with that in a book in a way that you just never, ever could on film. So yeah. again, I'm totally okay with him being a, a, like a big character, that none of this exists in the book. That that's perfectly fine. Um, you have you have to make changes, but there were just so many so many bizarre changes, and so many things that just go on forever that I couldn't understand. There are also too many people, like and and too many people I don't relate to. It's like like I don't want to harp on about Star Wars, and I know it's good to have subplots and you know intrigue, and even Star Wars has subplots. But Star Wars was just simple, wasn't it? There was a there was a young guy with floppy hair that was a bit like you, who mm-hmm. you wanted to win, and there was a guy that was obviously bad in a black suit, who you wanted to die. Right. And there was a pretty princess, and you wondered who was going to kiss the princess because she was pretty. Right. And that was it. And like everything else was just you know, and then everything stems from that. But watching this film t- today, I was like. So there are like five or six guys who seem to be good, but a couple of them, they seem to be bad. Yeah. And there's a, f- and that woman, that elf woman, for some reason, loves that dwarf. <laughs> oh, that was the and worst. And then she cries because he's d- dead, but. Can I, wait, wait, can I, can I stop you here? Can yeah, I stop here? Please. I had to write down this dialogue word for word because yeah. it was so awful. Yeah. When her, when uh, this whole love triangle does not exist in the books, this is just bizarre bringing yeah. it in. I don't understand. But she says, "If this is love, why does it hurt so much?" And mm. then the Elven King says to her, "Because it was real." Yeah. And it's just like, oh my god! I just felt nothing. I felt nothing for for anyone, and it was so humorless. And Martin Freeman was trying to be funny occasionally, I guess, but the film was completely devoid of humor and Ma- that's martin freeman's strength you know use him he he could bring a re- you know and occasionally he tried but yeah and and no. the character in in the books like it, martin freeman is excellently cast because he could pull off this kind of i'm a guy who's in a situation that is far beyond what i'm supposed to be doing yeah uh, but yeah he's he is underused in the movies but there but there were a bunch of just weird moments where the movie did try to be funny and i thought it just it fell yeah fell flat and it, again it was this weird tone shift where it's like this is this movie serious movie you can have funny moments in a serious movie but there were just things that became oh is this comical like they had a troll siege engine where this troll runs up to a wall and smashes it open yeah. but they have him then comically fall backwards unconscious it was it was one step away from having little birdies flying around yeah. his head in a yeah. circle on on screen when he falls over and it's like Oh, is this a dramatic scene where the wall has been breached and so I should care? Or is this a funny moment with a troll? You can't mix those you can't mix those two things together. They seem to try and give this the funny lines to um Gandalf, and I'm not convinced he's very good at funny. He's a fabulous yeah. actor, but I don't think he's very good. The f- the f- the original trilogy had, you know, Gimli and he as Gimli comic, works. And he yeah, he Gimli was funny, works. but there's no character in these films that pulled it off. Yeah, he, he I think he he was on the edge but totally totally yeah. worked. Yeah. Um I'm just I'm just trying to look at some, some of my notes here of just like things that things that irritate the crap out of me. Oh, oh my god. Okay. 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 So the final the final fight between Thor and Oakenshield and uh I can't remember which which that of the orcs he's supposed to be. On the ice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, on the ice, but he's He's a character that is mentioned in a single line in The Hobbit. It's just like an incidental person that they turn into this enormous thing. Mm. And it's it's him and his son, and I can never remember which one is which. Um, but anyway, so the final fight between the two Some, of them. Like the Defiler or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. It's Thor and Oakenshield, and it's him. And they're standing on this ice, and they're fighting each other. 
<laughs> like, okay, for some reason, who knows where, maybe I blinked, I wasn't paying attention. Suddenly, our main villainous orc has this long rock at the end of a chain mm. that he is swinging around and trying to hit Thorin Oakenshield with. Mm. And it was just, in, this fight scene went on, it felt like for five minutes of our orc trying to hit Thorin Oakenshield. Mm. And it, it reminds me a little bit of of like when I saw Avatar, which is a movie I did not like. And I find myself rooting for the villains to just, can we just finish this? And so I find myself in the theater feeling like, can you just, can you just hit him already? Like, I know he's going to die. Just kill him so this can end. Yeah. And then it's really irritating. Because you're using a mid-range weapon for a close melee fight. Like, he's, he's within feet of you. And one of your arms is a giant sword. Yeah, just, and, you're, and you're eight feet taller than him. Yeah, just stab him. Mm-hmm. Just stab him. Yeah. He's right there. You're within range. The only reason you're using this big weapon is so that you can dramatically miss him as you slowly swing it around. Like yeah. this is, you, you, you're using like a siege weapon in close combat. This makes no sense at all. He's within range. Just stab him. And the other thing I kept thinking of there was like, again, this like, we have no sense of the danger of anything is in the Lord of the Rings books, there are not many descriptions of individual dwarves ever taking on trolls. They're always doing it as an army because that's the only thing that makes any sense. Because yeah, he's eight feet tall and he's fighting a dwarf. And I was thinking, I bet if you took a, a kid who's like six years old and tried to train him to be the best fighter in the world and put him in armor. And then you you had me with a long sword versus this kid. I bet I could kill that kid just because I'm way bigger. It doesn't matter how good you are at fighting. If someone is just massively bigger than you, you're going to lose if it's yeah. coming down to, to close combat. It doesn't make any sense. The, o- the only way you can get around that is the thing like Dungeons and Dragons stats here is if you have amazing agility. But when yeah. you think of dwarves, do you think of really agile creatures? Is that one of their fundamental characteristics? <laughs> Obviously not. It's like, it's, like the, it's like the Spider-Man phenomenon. Spider-Man fights villains who are massively more strong than him. But his primary ability is his agility to avoid blows. But it's like this is not the situation here with this, with this dwarf versus this gigantic, incredibly strong orc. Yeah. And it just, it just loses all sense of danger. It just it just means it means nothing. We do it accept it in James Bond movies when like Goldfinger straps Bond to a, a you know a table with a slow moving laser that's going to cut him in ten minutes rather than just putting a bullet in his head. Yeah, but but, but here is the thing: it all comes down to the movies kind of establishing what they are, mm. right? And and Bond movies, at least the older ones, like like with the slow moving lasers, mm. they don't establish themselves as super serious films right in the yeah. beginning you know they're kind of lighthearted and they're kind of they're kind of campy yeah. um and the the hobbit is just going so hard to convince you like this is a serious important movie yeah you, like you can't then have cartoon physics everywhere if it's a serious important movie these things don't mix so two other two other quick things yeah maybe i missed something but this thorn oaken shield dude yeah. For the first half of the film, he's like bad. He's being, you know, he's he's going a bit loopy because of the yeah. evil and he's gone off the rails. Yeah. And then halfway through, he just seems to change his mind and like realize the error of his ways and says, actually, no, I'm going to be a good guy now and we're all going to hug and be buddies. Did Was there some tr- path to transformation that I missed that made him go from bad to good like i didn't get the redemption i didn't see the i didn't see the emperor lightning bolt moment where suddenly he realized the error of his ways and switched he just had this kind of little arty scene down in the vaults and then came back oh, up and said all right that was we're boring all good. and impo- and pointless yeah uh, there was there was no real transition like that okay and i was just making sure i wasn't like texting or something and missed, no, missed the you didn't miss anything but uh, but my final note here talking about unresolved things Again, yeah. a moment I kind of laughed out loud and felt bad. But luckily, there were very few people in the theater with me. Was after the 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 fight that lasts for a thousand years, all of a sudden, they're back in the Shire. Hmm. So B- Bilbo leaves and they they just flash forward and, and suddenly, oh, Gandalf is dropping him off at the Shire and he's going home. Yeah. And I thought, hey, wait a minute. 
what on earth happened to the whole point of this entire battle? Because the men and the elves and the dwarves had a disagreement over how the treasure was going to be oh, allotted. Yeah, yeah. Right? Right? There, there, was no, there was no conclusion to this. Yeah. Right? They just say, oh, the battle's over. And boom, Bilbo's back in the Shire. And there was, there was no resolution to what was the actual point of the entire fight. What is going to happen? Do the, do, right, do the men of Lake Town, do they get money to help them rebuild? Do the elves get their gems? What happens with, those, with the dwarves who show up? How does this all work? Thor and Oakenshield, who you think is the king under the mountain, is dead. What happens to his companions? Yeah. I know the answer because I read the book, but I, I, I could not believe that they spend so much time on all of the fights and adding in all this unnecessary stuff. And then they just, they just skip what happens. That shows to, how to unengaged everybody. I was. That yeah. how that I haven't even thought about that yet. But you're right. Yeah. There was no kind of. But also a big unresolved thing is at you know at the start of the Lord of the Rings movies, which presumably is what thirty years later or something. I guess. Uh, yeah, yes. something like that. Yeah. Another, yeah. Like presumably we still live in a Middle Earth where there exists a mountain that is full to the brim of like gold. Like <laughs> this is an amazing. There's a. This is an amazing place. This is like the center of the universe, and in the Lord of the Rings movies, it's not like has it has the gold just been distributed or <laughs> what? Yeah, but you're right. There's so anyway. Yeah. Another thing that bothers me is the issue of Legolas. Oh my god! Oh my god! Now, now I can obviously the age thing is a problem because he clearly <laughs> looks so much. Older and I kept uh, every time he was on screen, I kept thinking, get this 40 year old man off off camera. Yeah, because because then he pops up in the Lord of the Rings movies as this kind of fresh faced, handsome yeah. guy stuff. He, but- he looked he looked old in the in the in the first Hobbit movie. And yeah. I swear he like, he is really going through that transition of just being an, like an older grown up person. Yeah. And he just he just looks he looks laughable. On screen. Let's put that to laughable. one side for a minute, though. I'll, I'll put that to one side for a minute, you know, because, yeah. you know, the guy's getting older and they wanted to keep the same actor for, you know, okay, let's let's say that's that's insurmountable. Yeah. yeah, except for the fact that he's he's not mentioned at all in the original Hobbit movies and there's no reason to have him there. But yeah, we'll put it I aside. Guess, I guess girls like Orlando Bloom, don't they? But anyway. Find some other attractive elf dude. Like yeah. we're not we're not short of, of attractive humans in the world. You can find yeah. another one. Let's put that to one side. I didn't re- even realize that. But let's let's put that to one side and say you had to have him. The other big problem is not his appearance. It's his change in personality. Because he's he's not just going from an old man to a young man in appearance. He's going from this boring in the in the prequels, he's in the Hobbit. He's this sort of boring, serious guy uh, who's yeah, seeing all this amazing stuff. And then in the Lord of the Rings, he's fun and exciting and fresh faced, and like he clearly hasn't seen all the stuff he's seen in the Hobbit. Because like in the Hobbit, he's seeing he's seeing stuff that would just turn you into this like you know this kind of sad guy, I guess. And then he suddenly it's like he got rebooted for the. He's got yeah. this completely different personality that doesn't marry with what he's seen the years before. Yeah, it makes it makes no sense whatsoever his yeah. character arc there. Yeah, he's 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 supposed to be this like this young, sort of rebellious elf in in the Lord of the Rings, and and he's he's supposed to be different. Yeah, and he's he's the world's somberest man in yeah. this movie. And then he pops up again in Lord of the Rings, and he's he's party dude that everyone <laughs> yeah. wants to hang out with. And- yeah, he's eighteen years old, and he's lots of fun yeah. after after seeing hundreds and hundreds of his comrades. Yeah. die you know not that long ago and and the horrors of war and now he can't wait to ride off again yeah it's it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense no orlando bloom was just like this is a terrible terrible decision to have him in the movies uh, well i'm sorry to anyone who's listened to listen to this who hasn't seen the film it doesn't care, uh, no, no, sure no let's stopped. be honest nobody's listening to this who hasn't seen the movie yeah uh you know there's nobody's nobody's listening this far um <laughs> Who hasn't seen the movies? They, is, they, 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 they want a catharsis. Is, is there anything else we need to say? There's a lot we could say, but I, we oh man, I mean, I'm just looking through my notes. I'll I'll, I'll do a t- couple of couple of strange points. All right. One point: dune worms pop out of the ground uh, at one point. Do you remember the scene? Yeah, Gigantic they were, they were pretty worms pop cool, out. Actually, look at them. Okay. Look, yeah. So they're they're pretty cool. They don't exist in the books, but whatever, that's fine. And then what did they do? <laughs> They just disappeared, right? Yeah. As far as I could tell, they popped out of the ground once to look scary, and then yeah, what? I never saw them get killed. And they can't I, go I back never... through the hole because that's where all the soldiers are. 
Mm-hmm. I never saw them do anything, right? They just, they're just they just there on screen to look cool, just to be another piece of crap on the screen, and then yeah. nothing happens with them. Yeah. So that was that was terrible. Yeah. Um, they just just yeah, so so many things, but that one was one like why does why does this exist here? I have I have no idea. Uh, second thing, uh, other minor point that I think many movies suffer from. There's no sense of place at all. How far are these places from each other? Where the hell is anybody? Yeah. Compare and contrast. I think it's the two towers. I don't exactly remember which Lord of the Rings movie. But they do this thing, which I love because they can just barely pull it off, where at one moment, a bunch of characters just literally puts a map on the table and the camera focuses on the map and people point to different spots on the map and describe what's going on. They say, oh, Saruman's forces are coming from over here. We're coming from over this way. This is that far. And I, I always love that in the movie because it's it's sort of awkward, but it's also, we need this right now. I need to have an understanding of where the hell all these places are. Yeah. And this movie has has no understanding of where anything is, which makes everything just even more meaningless. Let me ask you this. To what extent has Peter Jackson done a George Lucas here and tarnished tarnished himself i mean he hasn't done he hasn't gone as far but has he done that has he has he undermined himself I, that's an interesting question um as that is a very interesting question um i i think i've said in this podcast before but I, I actually kind of hope that at some point in the future there is a redone version of the lord of the rings movies where they update the special effects I don't know how possible that is, um, but there are some shots in that movie where I thought, you know what, I would be okay with like a like a special edition version of these movies where they go back and try to clean up a bunch of stuff. Mm. Because there is, I always thought those movies were made just when they were technically possible, but I would have loved it if those movies were delayed like a couple years because of the technology. Mm. Um, but the Hobbit movies would almost make me worry about the same team ever going back yeah. And doing anything. And again, I, you know, I, I find it baffling. I don't know why these are so different. I, you know, I don't, even if you, even if they didn't want to make it into three movies, as we discovered last time, that, that it was supposed to be two. And let's say the studio was forcing them to make it into three. It doesn't, not, it's, even then the decisions don't make any sense about how the movies turned out, about making them so long and so padded with stuff. Hmm. So I, I don't, I don't because know. Because the studio I, may have been pressuring for three movies, but they wouldn't pressure for three long movies. Yeah, like they don't, they don't care how long it is. Yeah. They want three points of sale. Yeah, and you know, you could, you know, cut cut the movies down in half, and I think you could make something better. One of the things that I always kind of wondered in the uh, for the first movies was Peter Jackson kind of came out of nowhere, and I always wondered what the story was with how the heck did this guy get hired. Because I looked at his IMDb profile back in the day mm. about what has he done before The Lord of the Rings? And it seemed like it was almost nothing, like a couple of very small projects. Mm. And I always, I was never able to find out the answer, but like, how did this guy end up getting selected for this enormous, expensive, incredibly important project? And then he amazingly did just a, just a phenomenal, phenomenal job. And that always seemed like a mystery to me. And now I have another mystery of how did this same person and the same team of people around him produce something so terrible? Um, so I feel like like Peter Jackson is a is a bit of a mystery to me. I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand where he came from. I don't understand how he got originally selected, <laughs> and I don't understand how far how far he has fallen, um, yeah. which seems quite far. What do you think? Do you think he's he's rede- he's uh, unredeemed himself, or I am baffled. I am a bit baffled because he did he did it right with the Lord of the Rings and I mean maybe maybe the writing was on the roll maybe the warning signs were there in the Lord of the Rings and we ignored them those battle scenes that were just creeping on a bit too long and they were a bit too much and maybe we should have yeah it's, maybe, it's like it's like the hints in Return of the Jedi like the the shape of things to come yeah and it's and it's like it's almost like maybe he has this in common with George Lucas maybe he didn't maybe the things we liked he doesn't know what was good about it and he picked the wrong thing like he doesn't get why it worked hmm. and then when he tried to do it again he he uh accentuated the wrong things hmm. you know he thought he thought we all loved those battle scenes in his first 3 mm-hmm. and it was more we tolerated them because all the other stuff was so good 
Mm-hmm. So he he doubled down to use one of your favourite sayings on the wrong thing. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh But who knows? You know, he hasn't he hasn't done he hasn't done a lot of other brilliant stuff. But you know, I'd be pretty happy with Lord of Rings on my CV. So he's still done better than me. Yeah, fair, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, and and I will I always be uh, I always be grateful to him for the original three movies. Yeah. Um, to finish with something, we've been talking. It's been so somber. I feel like, and we've we've been complaining for a long time. Mm-hmm. This is this may be our longest show ever. This is our our the battle of the five armies perhaps. bumper Christmas special. <laughs> yeah, bumper Christmas special or incredibly boring long podcast. We will let the the viewers decide. I, uh, um, I mean, a lot of this is already gonna, is already going to be cut, isn't it? But anyway, go on. How are you gonna end? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I just thought as as a slightly a slightly fun thing, there has been a, a discussion on my Reddit that is related to the Lord of the Rings, which I have enjoyed a, a quite a great deal. Which is, um, listeners may know by now that my Reddit username is Mind of Metal and Wheels, and this has always been a Lord of the Rings reference. This is not a I am a robot reference, um, but it's from one of my my favorite lines in Lord of the Rings, which is a a comment where Treebeard is describing Saruman and he and he says oh Saruman has a, a mind of metal and wheels and Treebeard intends this as an insult but I always thought as a kid like that's a great line <laughs> a mind of metal and wheels that's amazing and so I use that as my reddit username and a whole bunch of people only just realized this after I put out the Lord of the Rings video because I I had to work that line in at some point in the video and I did and I think the light bulb went off for a bunch of people about oh that's why the reddit name is this <laughs> But so anyway, this led to a, a little discussion about there are five wizards, the five Istari, mm-hmm. and there are five guys who participated in the Random Acts of Intelligence show. And I think we are kind of known as a little group now. And so there was a big discussion about which which uh, Random Acts of Intelligence dude is which of the five wizards. So this is you, <laughs> me, Henry, Destin, yes. and Dirk from Vistus Dab Lilium. Derek from Veritasium, yeah. yes. <laughs> so it is, it is it is the five of us. Yeah. Um and it's just it is a fun little discussion um <laughs> about about who who is which. And it doesn't it doesn't work perfectly. The characteristics don't line up absolutely great. Um but so I guess I am Saruman in this situation. People have um, been quite over like I mean I don't understand it, but mm-hmm. I, I mean I know the characters vaguely and I've seen yeah. your video. But people mm-hmm. have been pretty unanimous in their classifications. I don't think there's a lot of arguing to be done here. People seem to agree on this agree on this, the, don't they? So there there is a there is one slightly contentious point. All right. You run yeah, me through I, the five and Yeah. Okay. So well the thing that I'll mention about me with being Saruman, I think is appropriate because I have very often thought that were I to be tempted by the ring, I would fall just <laughs> immediately. Although you don't like objects. I don't like objects. That is true. Right. But I am I am totally just aware that one of the ways that the rings the ring is supposed to work its evil is by tempting you with the power to do good of like wouldn't things just be great if you were in charge, right. right? And you and you know you could you could start making things go your way, and you could sort out all these problems if only you had more power. And I I would just be completely susceptible to that argument. I would not be able to resist in the slightest, <laughs> and I would go from normal dude to all shall love me in despair in a month. Okay. Um. So being Saruman is is about appropriate. All right. So then the question is. Uh, they're the two blue wizards, and the the consensus seems to be that that is Henry and Derek are the two blue wizards. Yeah. And then the question is, for you and Destin, mm. who is Radagast and who is Gandalf? This is, yeah, I mean, I, d- I know a bit about those two characters, and I know me and Destin quite well. Um, <laughs> and it's, most people seem to have put me down as this Radagast, mm-hmm. and I get the impression that's because of my caveman my caveman thing, they think I'm a bit, uh, you know, and that Radagast character in the film, he looks kind of caveman-like, doesn't he? He's kind of rough around the edges. and Yeah, I think it's the nature connection there. Yeah, and, and obviously Destin is yeah, okay, quite gotcha, wise gotcha. and smart and clever and and yes. Gandalf is the wise, wise one. So <laughs> that seems quite, well, that seems like a no-brainer to me. I can't see how. I can see how maybe people want to marry up Destin with Radagast because Destin's a man of nature, but I can't see how you would marry me up with Gandalf. 
Gandalf is <laughs> Gandalf is wise and clever and does good stuff and everyone likes him and that's not that's not quite my uh, my skill set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. I, I'm I'm glad that you're coming and I don't want to I don't want to put you down in, no. in, in any way. But no. being a, being a Gandalf is 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 quite a quite the thing and i've got to say I, i'm if i have to vote i'm putting destin down as yeah. as, as gandalf yeah there i don't think i'm uh, worthy of any of being any wizard but <laughs> if i have to be the weird the weird one i'll take him well i would i would say i i do not i refuse to accept the movie portrayal of radagast as anything to do with the actual character of radagast mm. so i am not i i i disavow the movie radagast and accept only the book version of Radagast, okay. which is almost entirely unknown, but just a, a wizard who is involved with nature and does not does not get involved in all of these affairs about battles. So I, yeah. I still see, I'd oh, say well, you're I more would, of a I Radagast. Could, uh, I'll, I'll go with that. I'm not I'm not an outdoorsman, but I do mm-hmm. like a bit of nature. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't tell you my story. Oh yeah, I am. Um, I'm just rubbish at everything in life. <laughs> and like I just can't manage myself and like for example uh-huh, I went away uh-huh. to a cottage in the countryside this week with my sister and friends and family mm-hmm. and like drove all the way back home after this w- week away and like realized I'd left my coat and credit card back in the cottage mm-hmm. and like had to go all the way back and get it so anyway I went and saw the film today mm-hmm. and then left and went walking around the shops and just wandered aimlessly and then went back to the car park and went to pay for my parking and couldn't find my wallet and my wallet had fallen out of my pocket in the cinema. Oh man! So it was such an adventure. I went back to the I went back to the cinema and talked to lost. And then I had to go back into the cinema and get like my phone out as a torch. And I was crawling. I couldn't remember where I sat, so I was crawling around under all these seats looking for my wallet. <laughs> and I found it. It was more exciting than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> 